All right, I'll bet you never expected this to be a thing, but there was a period when DC Comics created Scooby-Doo Apocalypse. The concept was, what if the ideas of Scooby-Doo existed in a post-apocalyptic future with real monsters and villains? Yeah, it's a crazy story that is incredible, so I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. This is the Comic Story Channel. I take comic books, turn them into audio dramas. If you like this type of content, give it a like and subscribe, and let's get into it. Our story begins at the Blazing Man Festival in the Nevada desert with journalist Daphne Blake and her cameraman Fred Jones, following up on a big lead from a mysterious informant. Though she was once a top-rated journalist, she has since fallen from grace and now hosts Daphne Blake's Mysterious Mysteries on the Knitting Channel. However, as the two of them leave, a man and a dog in the crowd watch them, knowing exactly who they are. Except the dog, Scooby, doesn't really care to listen to what the man is saying. The man tells Scooby that it's already been a big risk for him to take him out of the complex. But fine, he'll put on the emoto goggles. The dog begins to smile as the man puts the goggles on, and after setting up the receivers in his contact lenses, he can see Scooby's emoticon telling him that he clearly wants to get some pizza. But down below in the complex, Dr. Velma Dinkley is told by security that that hipster doofus took one of their subjects outside. Again. Velma tells them not to worry about it for now. If the two of them make a scene, go get them. Things could be much worse, but for now, she's going to return to her quarters and is not to be disturbed. A short while later, Daphne and Fred sit waiting for their contact to arrive. And that's when behind Fred, a rock begins to lift up with a person crawling out of it. He throws his camera at her, shouting, Mole people! But as the camera knocks the woman out, he realizes that that may have been their contact. He tries to wake her up, but Daphne yells at him, asking if he really thinks that's going to work. And that's when the two of them begin to argue as the woman wakes up, stating, You two really suck at hellos. Daphne and Fred help Velma up, and as they do, they begin to hear a growling, and then they look back up to see Scooby standing on a rock, snarling. Velma tells them that it must be from the goggles reacting to the receivers in her glasses, telling Scooby that they're a threat. She tries to tell Scooby to heal, but then the man from before runs up asking, what did you think you were doing running off like that? Is that Dr. Dinkley? The man then asks what she's doing outside of the complex because she never leaves it. And why is she with that hot babe for Mysterious Mysteries? Daphne takes offense to that, but she decides she'll give him an autograph anyway. And Velma tells everyone to be quiet. They have to go into the complex in a hurry so she can explain what's going on. She explains that this facility is privately funded by a group of four concerned scientists regarding the ultimate survival of the human race. And right now, they need to hurry and get to a safe zone. The man says that there is no such place in the complex. But Velma tells him that he's nothing more than a dog trainer. There's a lot of things that he doesn't know. So the man says, call me Shaggy, all my buddies do. And she tells him that according to her records, his name is Norval Rogers, and she is certainly not his buddy. She hands Daphne a clipboard with all four of the original scientists' research, stating that none of their work has ever even been entered into a computer. After reading it, Daphne tells her this can't be authentic, and Velma confirms that it is nanite technology that can be dispersed across the world. This in particular will root into human hosts and transform them. The intention is to essentially infect humanity with a techno virus. Shaggy steps in there, stating, hey, on. I've been working here for three years and I've never heard about any of this. This complex develops enhanced technology for Uncle Sam, like the headgear that Scooby is wearing. He's a smart dog prototype. And Velma stops him stating, what did I just say? You're just a dog trainer. You don't know anything. As they continue to go deeper into the complex, Velma welcomes everyone to the safe zone. The room was created so that the nanites could complete their work, but the creators would have a safe room to hide in. However, things have changed. The original intent of the project was to weed out man's baser instincts. Greed, anger, but now, Daphne stops Velma stating, you would know, wouldn't you, because according to these notes, you were a part of the team that infected the world. You've released a virus that is self-replicating and is spreading across the globe. Velma tries to defend herself, though. The project was meant to save the world, but once we learned that the four had changed it, making it so that it infected people so they would become docile so they could be controlled, I decided I had to expose them, which is why I contacted you. Thankfully, though, the program can only be activated once all four of the scientists are here to enter in their passwords, and that's when the safe room doors shut and a siren goes off. Velma shouts out that this can't be happening. The nanites, they've been activated, but the four scientists aren't here. She then runs out stating that it could possibly be a glitch, and she's going to run a global scan to see if they've been activated. If the nanites haven't been yet, there may be a way to shut them, but that's when the lights go out. She says it looks like the power to the complex has gone out, and right now, they don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. After a bit, the emergency generators kick on and the power is restored, and the group decides that they should go out and take a look to make sure that everything is fine. But as they walk through the complex, Velma sees one of her co-workers, Eric Kramer. She tells everyone to relax, She's gonna go talk to him and see what's going on, but as she gets closer, he turns around and he's a mutated creature trying to bite her. Velma screams, Jinkies! And she begins to run away. But before Dr. Kramer can give chase, Scooby jumps on him, knocking him down. Everyone begins to run away, but as they leave, a second creature appears. And instead of following, the two creatures begin to fight each other. Velma tells everyone that she needs to understand what's going on. Clearly, something has changed them. 
So right now, they're gonna have to head into the security office. As Velma loads up the security cameras, everybody sees what's going on. The complex is now filled with those things. And it's time for them to get out of there. Thankfully, the complex is stocked up with weapons that they can use to help them get out of the main doors. The gang loads up on guns and they begin to creep out of the room. And Shaggy tells everyone, just for the record, I have never fired a gun before. As they turn a corner, a hand reaches out calling for help. And that's when Shaggy asks if it's Becky? The transformed woman leaves out, pushing Fred away, and then jumps on top of Shaggy, telling him, yes, yes it is, and I've never felt better. Velma quickly swings the butt of the rifle, hitting Becky, but Becky also swings back, knocking Velma into a wall. Scooby jumps back into attack again, but Becky catches him and gets ready to bite, and that's when Daphne grabs the gun and opens fire on Becky's neck. Becky's neck explodes, and Shaggy says that that was Becky Davis from Animal Control, and you just killed her. Fred says she did what she had to, but Daphne grabs Fred, stating, I just killed a human being. She turns and punches Velma, stating, this is all your fault. You helped those four lunatics. But before Daphne can continue yelling, Shaggy tells everyone that he found a way through the vent shaft. Fred asks if it's safe, and that's when another creature appears. So he tells everyone, you know, we should probably just go. He starts shooting the monster, and everyone begins crawling through the vent, stating that there should be at least one vehicle they can use. Dr. Krebs ongoing experiment. As the group calls out, they stand in front of a giant armored vehicle, and Shaggy tells them, this is it. Not sure why he called it the mystery machine, though. Daphne asks if this is really going to get them out of this building, but that's when they hear talking coming from above them, telling them, no more think. And they look up to see more monsters sitting there telling them, there is only dying now. The monsters start jumping down and everyone begins blasting their way through trying to get to the truck. But as Daphne is firing, she keeps telling herself, these are not people, these are not people. And then she runs out of ammo. As she begins to cry, Shaggy grabs her and she tells him to just let her go. Dying here will be the best. And then he tosses her in the cab of the truck. Everyone piles in and Shaggy jumps into the driver's seat and then he tries to start the truck up. But the monsters continue clawing their way in. Scooby bites one, but a second one starts reaching in and Fred grabs a gun, except the gun is out of ammo. A monster then jumps on him and starts to scrape his nails across across Fred's face, and Velma jumps up, slamming a first aid kit into its head. Daphne kicks the monster out as Shaggy finally manages to get the truck started and begins plowing through the swarm. And as he drives, Velma tells him to slow down. There's a heavily fortified gate ahead, but Shaggy tells her, Nope, and he steps on the gas. Outside of the complex, the Mr. Machine bursts from the garage, and it stops just before tipping over the guardrail. Once the truck is at a complete stomp, Scooby says, Ruh oh and the group looks out to see the people from the Blazing Man Festival, but they have now all turned into monsters. While the monsters are currently busy attacking each other, the group decides that this might be a good time to leave, and a short while later, the gang stops by a gas station to find it completely empty. So what better time to pick up a few snacks? Except the store isn't completely empty, as a vampire opens the door from the back room. So after everyone finally gets some food in their stomachs, they decide to take turns making sure that no other monsters are coming their way. Velma begins to wake up to let Daphne get some sleep, and as she calls out to her, Daphne comes out of the truck stating, it seems Shaggy's friend was also making weapons. Also, Scooby's been keeping watch while she's been digging through the van. Velma looks over stating that that's kind of peculiar. Scooby was actually the most docile of the smart dog prototypes, but since this, he's started to become rather brave. From what Daphne found, Velma decides that maybe she should make an inventory of Dr. Krebs' weapons. But as Daphne sits back down, the vampire crawls on the rooftops looking down. He then calls out for more monsters to come and his arms begin to crawl their way out from the underground. As the vampire begins to make his way down, Scooby's already there growling. Daphne hears the growls and rushes over to make sure that Scooby is fine and when she turns the corner, Scooby is already taking care of the vampire. So Daphne tells him to move away, she's got this and she pulls the trigger on her gun. A giant energy blast shoots out of the rifle blowing the vampire's upper half away. And then as the two of them look at the dead vampire, they begin to hear thumping coming from the van. They all run over to see Velma falling out on her back holding a controller and a monster steps out stating you will never stop us we are the new masters of the and then a small drone flies past his head the monster looks at it and then it fires a laser cutting through his head and he falls out of the van Scooby says once again uh oh and Daphne asks what and he says uh oh that everyone looks over to see the vampires beginning to regrow his body parts and everyone decides that it might be a good time to leave they all hop back into the mystery machine and they drive off to the next location mall mart after a bit of salvaging Shaggy tells him that it's kind of a mess in there, but there is food, electronics, medical supplies, and everything else that they could possibly need. Velma tells everyone that that's good, then they should have a laptop that she could use to connect to one of the complex's other facilities. But as Daphne walks with Velma, they find a dead body on the ground, and once Velma inspects it, she pulls something off of it. She shows it to Daphne, stating that it seems like they may not have been the only ones not infected. Outside, Shaggy and Fred begin loading up the Mr. Machine with the supplies, and they decide that they shouldn't worry. Things are about to get a lot better. But behind them, a monster swarm begins to gather. While Velma begins working on her 
her laptop, her and Daphne hear loud crashing noises coming out of the front of the store. Daphne runs over and finds Fred firing one of Dr. Krebs' energy cannons into the group of monsters, while Shaggy jumps away screaming, ZOICS! Daphne starts shooting to give the two cover, and everyone runs to the back of the store, and as they run through the halls, Thelma tells everyone to get in here, and Shaggy says, Oh right, I almost forgot about her! To which she tells him, Oh, that's very heartwarming. Everyone runs into the stock room and slams the door shut while the monsters begin beating on the door, and Fred quickly runs over grabbing 70 pounds of happy oats to keep the door blocked. But Shaggy mentions, You know, this might not be the only door back here. Fred realizes that he's right. Normally, there's a loading dock with access to the outside, so him and Scooby will need to go check it out while everyone else keeps watch. Shortly after Fred leaves, though, Thelma tells everyone to be quiet and listen. The monsters have stopped trying to get in. It might be possible that unlike the vampires that they fought, that these ones may not have any intelligence, and they're just reacting to instincts. They might move on and try to find food elsewhere. Elsewhere in the stock room, Fred and Scooby begin checking through the loading docks, and Scooby begins sniffing, stating, Rotwaron! Fred turns and sees a little girl asking if he's one of the things that came from under her bed, because she tells him that the monsters under her bed, they're real, and the Daphne appears asking if everything's okay. Fred tells her, yeah, just this little girl. We have to protect her before, and then the little girl's head splits open, and three giant plant-like mouths fly out, grabbing Fred. The monsters outside the doors hear the gunshots and begin storming back into the doors, and Velma and Shaggy begin climbing the shelves. Back with the others, Daphne begins to pick up Fred after Scooby finished biting the last piece of the monster girl up, and they all begin to climb the shelves. The monsters continue to break in, and everyone remains silent as they sit on top of the shelves. Through their searching, they found nothing, and the monsters begin to attack each other. Hours start to pass, and once the last of the monsters leave, the gang decides to climb back down. Melmo runs over to the door to look out the window, and Scooby pokes her with his nose, asking if everything's broken. She stomps her foot, stating, No! You just scared me half to death! Actually, three quarters to death! Once the last of the doors have been secured, Velma tells everyone that they need to hurry and try to log on to the complex's servers. If she can reach them, they might be able to get assistance. But Daphne stops her, stating that they're the ones who caused all of this, and that's if any of them are alive to even help us. Velma says that they won't know unless they make an attempt, but she may have dropped the laptop while they were escaping. Daphne storms off, telling herself, Velma is the cause for all of this. I have a right to be mad, but maybe I'm being a little harsh. She was trying to expose her bosses, which is a good thing, but maybe she just needs an outlet for her fear and anger and is taking it out on Velma. Or maybe her suspicions of her not telling her everything is true. Elsewhere, Shaggy and Velma search for another laptop, and Shaggy mentions that he thinks that he may have an idea of how the project was supposed to work. The goal was to pacify the population and breed out the instincts for violence, right? Maybe their way to get everyone to mellow out was to keep them separated. If the nanites bred out social instincts, it would shy people away from being in groups. Because there's power in groups, people start to get ideas. And that's when suddenly a laptop box flies through the air, hitting Velma and Daphne shouts, I found a laptop! As she walks over, Shaggy says in a weird way that was actually nice of her. Maybe she's starting to warm up. After their most recent escape, the gang finds themselves at the Nevada Mall Mart, where Shaggy is facing his biggest crisis yet. He has to pee. Fred tells him that's nice, and Shaggy says that they've been holed up here the whole time, and all he's been doing is drinking those gallon jugs of ginger beer. A few moments later, Fred asks, is that better? And Shaggy shouts, you have no idea. Velma then tells everyone they have to find a way out of here. Their best bet would be to try and gain access to the roof, for they can get a much broader view of their situation. And Daphne says as much as she hates to admit it, that's not a terrible idea. Velma then leads the group up to the roof access, and when they open up the door, they spot two of these monsters sitting there. Velma whispers that they need to go back before they, but Daphne says, no way, they're not going anywhere. And she takes Velma's laptop and throws it over the edge. The laptop lands and shatters on the ground, causing the two monsters to quickly jump after them, giving the gang a chance to actually look at their surroundings. As they look around, they see the monster hordes all around them, and they realize that there is no way for them to get back to the mystery machine, their van. Everyone heads down the stairs, and Velma says they need to figure out a way to get a clear path. So everyone grabs something that could be considered flammable. And after stockpiling propane fireworks and an assortment of other things, Velma says that if anyone has a deity to pray to, this is going to be the time to do so. Velma then sprays lighter fluid on the ground, bringing it back to their hiding spots, and then lights it up. A few moments pass, and Daphne tells Fred that she knew that this wasn't going to work. And just as she says that, the flammables explode, blowing a hole through the roof, startling all of the nearby monsters. Daphne shouts to Velma, that she almost killed them, and Velma says, well, almost doesn't count. Now be quiet, or she'll bring the monster's attention to them. Daphne tells her that she doesn't get to tell her what to do, but a monster runs by, with Daphne ducking behind the wall, stating, right, getting down, shutting up now. Once the initial waves run past, everyone looks up to see that there are still a few monsters outside. And while the group tries to figure out what to do next, Velma suggests that she should be the one to get there and create a distraction. Scooby runs up, telling him, uh-oh, right, 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 right. 
Then he begins to bark as he runs outside by the mystery machine. The monsters begin to chase after Scooby and Daphne tells them that they need to go help him or they're going to kill him. Velma stops them telling them that they can't. If they go, they're going to die. Their only hope is getting into the van. As everyone makes a break for it, Daphne looks back noticing Fred isn't with them. Back inside, Fred is carrying a box of supplies and he says they need this stuff if they're going to survive on the road. Daphne tries to tell him that they can always find more and then a monster jumps up from one of the aisles and onto Fred. As he does, the monster pushes down, snapping Fred's leg and Daphne quickly spins around to shoot the monster's head off. Daphne shouts that she's going to need some help and Velma runs over to help support Fred while the two of them help him into the van. Shaggy tells everyone that they better fasten their seatbelts because this is gonna be a bumpy ride. As Shaggy speeds out of the parking lot, Velma notices that Dr. Krebs, the owner of the van, neglected to install seatbelts, and Shaggy tells her, I was not being literal about fastening your seatbelts. A short while later, Velma steps out of the back of the van, and Daphne asks, how is it? Velma says that she did the best that she could, but there's a serious break. There's some of the bone piercing out of the skin as she's extremely worried about infection. They're going to need proper tools and drugs to treat this. Shaggy points across the street at a hospital, and he says, how about that? We just gotta hope the beasties aren't crawling around inside of there. Velma tells him that they're gonna have to try. They have to help Fred no matter the cost. And Shaggy sighs telling him, huh, are we really gonna risk everything for Fred and leave Scooby behind? Guess human lives are more important than dogs. Velma says that they would have attempted to try and help Scooby, but they all would have died. Besides, the glasses that Scooby is wearing has GPS on them. He can track her glasses as well, and he can make it back here in no time. A bit later, as everyone begins to head into the hospital, Scooby does in fact make his way back to everyone. The group props Fred up onto a nearby bed and Velma begins to rummage through the cabinet stating that they're going to need to set the break. Shaggy says, I don't do well with these sort of things. I once threw up watching Grey's Anatomy. Daphne shouts, telling him that they have been blasting monsters to bloody bits and this is what he doesn't have the stomach for? And Velma says, actually, Shaggy and Scooby could go look for medical supplies in other rooms. Just grab whatever you can and I'll sort it out. Shaggy hurries out of the room telling him, no problem. And seconds later, him and Scooby hear the snap of Fred's leg being put back in place and they run out of the room. As they turn the corner, there's another scream and the two jump and Daphne runs out asking, why did you scream? Shaggy says, actually, it wasn't us. That wasn't Fred. Daphne then says that was a human scream, someone in terrible pain. And Shaggy tells her, or it could be a monster mimicking the sound of a human in terrible pain. Besides, we're the only ones who made it out of the plague alive. Everyone else has been transformed into whatever those things are. Daphne then says, according to Velma, maybe not. Back at the Mall Mart, they found a dead human body. And after a bit of digging around, Velma found that he had a pacemaker. There could be a connection between the pacemaker and the fact of the person who hasn't been mutated by the nanites. Suddenly, there's another scream and everyone runs outside to regroup. Daphne says that there is someone inside of there. They have to help him. They just can't turn their backs now. And Fred reaches out stating that they don't know what kind of horrors could be inside. He's not letting her go. Daphne pulls away telling him, you can hardly stand, just stay in the van. And Shaggy says, you should have known by now she isn't gonna change her mind. As the three head back inside, Scooby leads the way into the room and they turn on the lights and they find a mutilated human body. Shaggy begins to panic and Daphne tells him, be quiet, we're gonna have to hurry and find the other survivors. Then there's a second scream and Daphne begins to run up the stairs towards where that sound came from. As they burst into the next room, they find more mutilated bodies scattering the ground. Daphne says, all right. Maybe we should go turn back. And then there's a groan coming out of the one of the rooms. She starts charging forward and Shaggy shouts that she's going the wrong way. Daphne then readies herself by the door and asks Shaggy if he's ready. He tells her, nope, but let's do it anyway. And Daphne slams open the door with her rifle drawn. In front of them is a blue monster in a lab coat telling them that he's terribly sorry, but no one is to be admitted without an appointment. Shaggy and Daphne stare at the man on the bed with several needles sticking out of his chest, struggling, telling them, kill me, please. The monster looks back at the man, telling him, Why would we do that? I'm a physician who swore an oath to never injure or do harm. Daphne points the gun at the monster, and he tells her to please lower that and wait outside. I'll be with you in a moment. Shaggy says, Maybe we should leave. And Daphne shouts, No way am I letting this doctor torture this helpless human. The monster pulls out a scalpel from his arm, and he tells her, You must understand, sometimes pain is required to heal. The rifle goes off, shooting the monster's arm off, and he shouts, What have you done? Code silver, code silver! Daphne asks, what's that? And Shaggy says, that means that there's someone in the hospital with a weapon. I saw it on Grey's Anatomy once. But before they could run, the entire room begins to twist around and the bed begins to suck the man inside of it. Back outside, Fred says that he can't wait any longer. We have to do something. Just then, a window from the second floor is blown out and out comes Shaggy, Daphne, and Scooby. While Scooby and Daphne get down, Shaggy says, uh, after she just shot out the window, everything looks normal again. Velma says that she just wants to make sure you're telling me that the room came alive? And Shaggy tells everyone, look, it was majorly weird in there, even for us. 
The next morning in Gartersville, Nevada, the gang wakes up in a house, and Daphne asks, where is Velma? Shaggy tells her that actually she's been up for a while. She snagged a computer from the hospital and was trying to hack the complex's servers. Upstairs, Velma sits on a bed, typing away at the computer when she finally manages to get into the servers. The moment she does, she runs to the back room to throw up. And as she sits back, she mutters to herself, those arrogant, irresponsible, deceitful, self-righteous bastards. The truth is, I have no one to blame but myself, though. If it wasn't for me, none of this would have been happening. While Velma keeps to herself what she found on the servers, the gang continues to travel to California. Once night comes, they all shack up in a motel. And while Velma gets back to work at the computer, she decides that it's time to get some fresh air. As she opens the door, she sees Scooby sitting out front. And after coughing, she asks, What are you doing here? He tells her, I'm worried about you. So she coughs again, telling him, It's very sweet of you. I think I've just developed a minor cough is all. She then tells him that she needs to get someone from the van so he can go ahead and get to bed now. Scooby says, Night! And he heads off. And once Scooby's out of view, Velma runs. With one last look at the motel, she leaves into the night. And then back in the motel room, Velma left the laptop on with her access to her findings. And at the bottom of the screen is a note that simply says, I'm sorry. What she discovered changes everything in the Scooby-Doo apocalypse. This is an interesting world. One that has been changed for the worse. Monsters and demons are everywhere. And only the Scooby gang can save the day. following morning, Velma wakes up in a cold sweat after having a nightmare. She leans up, rubbing her head, stating that it was astonishing what a fever of a 103 can do to your brain. But the nightmare felt so real. All those monsters felt real. Velma stocks up a medicine as if she's getting ready to leave, and she thinks that Daphne is probably thinking how she's going to kill her, but she can't let that happen. Not if she's going to undo what has been done, if it can be undone. Velma yells at herself, saying no. She can't question her resolve now. Her hubris destroyed the world. Now it's time to save it. Later that night, while the monsters chase after Velma, she sighs, asking why she didn't bring a gun. Oh wait, she knows why. Because she's an idiot. One of the monsters manages to rip the top of the bus off that she's driving and ends up driving into the side of a cliff. Another speeds up, rolling onto it and crushing it, barely giving Velma time to escape. Before she can even finish her sentence, the monster's head explodes and Shaggy slides down the cliff, shouting, Don't just stand there! Run! As Velma starts climbing up, she says that she doesn't understand why are they saving her. And Daphne tells her, just shut up so you can focus on shooting things. Daphne walks back up stating that those were monster trucks. Literally, monster trucks. Can you believe that? Velma says that she presumes they read the documents on the laptop and they know that all of this is because of her. She was the one who designed the nanites. Daphne tells her, yeah, but the question is, what is she going to do about it? Velma then asks why come after her, to punish her, to make her pay for what she's done? Daphne stares for a moment and then hugs Velma, telling her to never do that again. And after a good shake, Daphne says that it's okay to hug her back, you know. Velma tells her that physical intimacy has never been her forte, but she'll give it a shot. Later, as everyone heads back to the van, Velma says again that she is still confused after everything that she's done. And Daphne tells her that while they know that they were misguided, her intentions were noble. It doesn't mean that she doesn't bear some responsibility, but the past is the past, and now it's time for them to go save the world. Meanwhile, over in Seattle, one of the four sits in his tower watching the monsters rampage throughout the city. As he watches, he thinks to himself, what a mess. And I have my idiot family to blame for this. I loved my brothers, and while my mother was off nursing her alleged nervous breakdowns and our father was terminally self-involved, we've created an unbreakable bond. We were the four, born to privilege and power, and my father said that we would be kings of this world. Each of us flew up the ladder of success to each of our respective professions. Hugo was an army general. Cheeves rose to be one of the most beloved and influential senators. Quentin joined the intelligence services in a role so critical and sensitive that he has no public title. And as for me, Rufus T. Dinkley, I'm simply the greatest businessman to ever live. The Dinkley brothers have an unshakable faith in themselves and their destiny. And the complex sounded like a splendid idea at the time. As his brothers turned to nurture the dreams of a better world, how could their dreams enrich him, expand his empire, give him more control over the brainless rabble out there? As Rufus continues thinking to himself, his wife Daisy says that it seems that Dr. Kapoor is acting up again. Rufus says, why are all the geniuses so high strung? Hell, you should have seen Velma. But my annoying sister is either dead or worse, and Kapoor is our only hope at beating this. Rufus then walks into the next room where Kapoor is tied to a chair and he asks, what is the problem? Kapoor shouts that the problem is that he's been held prisoner for weeks. We have. And Rufus stops him telling him, wine, wine, wine. You're one of the complex's greatest minds and I want solutions. Kapoor yells, I just need food and rest. I can't think straight like this. And Daisy comes in telling him that she just wanted to let him know that she had taken her pills and is going to go rest for a little while now. As Daisy leaves, Rufus says that he was planning on divorcing her before all of this happened. But she intrigues him, so no. Like, why didn't she transform like the rest of them? Why didn't they? 
Kapoor shouts that he doesn't know, and Rufus just slams his head into the keyboard, yelling that it's his job to know! Rufus straightens his tie, stating, Oh well, another one dead. I just need to find where I put the other scientists. Elsewhere in Seattle, the gang arrives, and Daphne asks Velma why does she think that they did it? Also, the original design of the nanites. And Velma says that that is not a pertinent question. Her vision was to use the nanites to weed out the baser instincts of humanity. But they do know that her brothers attempted to use her technology to create a world of easily controlled sheep who would mindlessly do their bidding. But the problem is they don't know why they did that. When the nanites were dispersed, they instead infected the populace like a toxic plague, mutating everyone with rare exceptions. The files that she uncovered indicate that while her brothers were overriding the nanites' programming, they inadvertently amplified the nanites' already formidable capacity for independent thought. Why did the nanites actually change their own mission? And now we're hoping that my brother Rufus can help us find the answer? Velma then says that even though her brothers are devoted to each other, Rufus only cares about himself. He would betray them in a heartbeat if he viewed them as a threat to his self-interest. Back with Rufus, he sits in his balcony looking at a monster firing his gun, grazing the monster's shoulder. And Daisy tells him, why would you do that? You just made it angry. And Rufus shouts, what are you talking about? I killed the beast. And what Rufus Dinkley says is true. Daisy backs up stating, of course, perfect shot. Rufus heads back inside, stating that it's time for them to check on Dr. Kapoor and check on the progress with, but Daisy stops him, telling him, don't you remember you killed him along with Dr. Williams? Rufus hits Daisy to the ground, telling her that she is upsetting him, and she knows how much he hates it when she upsets him. Has she been cutting down on her pills? She wipes the blood from her nose, saying that she doesn't want to take them anymore. Things get too confusing, and Rufus shouts, take the damn pills. Back out of the streets, Velma points at one of the buildings, stating that there it is, Dinkley Tower. And as the group moves closer in, Scooby begins to growl when Shaggy sees the doorway. Around the entrance are cut up monster parts, and Daphne says that it looks like a shrine of some sort. As she gets closer, she checks on the bodies and says they're still warm, which means whatever happened, happened not that long ago. As everyone sneaks in, Shaggy asks why haven't any of the alarms gone off. And Velma says because they don't hear anything doesn't mean that there haven't been any alarms going off. Knowing Rufus, he's probably watching them right now. He's an arrogant bully and a brat. Daphne then says that if he's listening, he would have heard her say that. Velma tells her, Rufus knows exactly how I feel about him, which is the exact same way that he feels about me. Over in Rufus' office, he sits on a computer, watching his brother Hugo shoot himself, and says a military hero took the coward's way out. His own brother, a pathetic suicide. Suddenly, Rufus hears something, and he runs to the balcony to see a horde of monsters swarming in front. He shouts that it looks like he sparked a movement. These are my beasts. They won't attack me. They love me. But outside of the office, Shaggy, Daphne, Velma, and Scooby find a door with just a bunch of random things pushed in front of it. Daphne says that it doesn't seem like much of a barricade, and Velma begins to climb on top of it. Shaggy asks what she's doing, and Velma knocks on the door and says, the obvious choice. She looks back at the door and says, you don't think that if they get in, Rufus told the monsters don't knock? Looks like the non-mutants can get past his security systems. Daisy then says, hello? And Velma says, that's Daisy, Rufus's seventh or eighth wife. I don't know anymore. Velma shouts, it's your sister-in-law. Open up the door. And Daisy asks if it's really her. Then Rufus says, I know that irritating voice anywhere. Open the door and get clear. Daisy tells him to wait and Rufus cocks his gun sighing, asking, do you not understand simple instructions? Open the damn door. Then the gun goes off three times. It's only been a night since everyone made their way to his penthouse, and as Shaggy looks out into the streets, he sees the monsters have only grown in size. While keeping watch, Rufus's wife Daisy comes in and tells him that he is awake now and would like to speak with them. Shaggy walks back in from the balcony, stating that he can't say that he's looking forward to this. And as Shaggy heads into the next room, Rufus shouts, asking, Are you the one that hit me? And Shaggy tells him, No, it was our fearless leader, Daphne. Rufus yells, There is no way a woman is capable of overpowering Rufus T. Dinkley. And Shaggy tells him, Sorry to demolish your personal mythology, but she did. Rufus says, Fine then, let's get down to business. Why are you here and why haven't you been mutated by the Nanite Plague? Shaggy tells him, Slow down a second. If you want answers, you better talk to your sister. Shaggy then yells, calling for Velma, and Daphne yells back, stating that they'll be right there. While Daphne finishes cleaning the cut on Velma's head, she says that she's really dreading this. And Daphne says, well, you need to get over yourself. We came a long way looking for your brother to find out what he knows about the catastrophe that the complex unleashed. Velma yells, Rufus shot at her. If she wasn't knocked out of the way, she'd be dead. And Daphne begins putting on the bandage, stating, yeah, yeah, I guess I've gotten used to you in an odd and uncomfortable way. Velma sighs as she puts on her glasses, and as she walks out, Rupert says, Well, 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 if it isn't my beloved sister, the genius which I use very loosely is responsible for all of this. Velma tells him that she'll take responsibility for her own part. But while Velma speaks with Rufus, Fred sits in the mystery machine wondering when everyone's coming back. He's still injured. Just then his phone begins to ring and he grabs it asking, who's there? Shaggy asks, 
Who the hell else would be calling you? And why are you whispering into your phone? Fred tells him there's a large group moving around me and towards the tower. This thing's taking a major turn for the weird. The monsters have built some kind of effigy in the shape of Bellman's brother. Shaggy looks out and sees a woven figure and says that it means that they gotta get out of here fast. He hangs up telling Velma that she better wrap this up. They gotta go, no! Rufus tells them that they've only just arrived. Allow him to have Daisy cook them a lovely dinner and Velma shouts stating that they didn't come for dinner. They came here to find a way to fix the mess that they've created. They overrode her program so that they could control the populace. Their tampering somehow amplified the Nanite's capacity for independent thought. Rufus says that her goal was an idealistic one. Wanting to uplift humanity, bring forth the golden age. But man is savage, ignorant, and the animals need to be controlled. That is why we've altered the Nanite's programming. However, as for this monster plague. I am in the dark about it as much as you. If anyone can help solve this mystery, it'd be you. So right after dinner, we're gonna head down to the lab and pick up where my scientist left off. Daphne asks, how close were they to the cure? And Rufus laughs telling her, oh no, I wasn't interested in a cure. I was interested in becoming the master of those creatures. Velma smacks the glass from Rufus's hand, telling him that he's crazy. And he goes on stating, and you are woefully naive. You see a disaster, I see an opportunity. And sadly, our poor brother Hugo broke under that strain. Velma asks, is he? And Rufus tells her, oh yes, dead by his own hand. Imagine that. But together, the two of us can rise up. Allow me to do what our father should have done and bring you to greatness. Velma asks, do you really mean that? Me at your side? And Rufus tells her, of course. And Velma walks out thinking about it. She looks at the doctor that Rufus killed in the laptop with her brother Hugo on it and then closes the laptop. As she walks back out and whacks Rufus in the groin with the laptop, she jumps on top of him, beating, shouting, you are a sick and twisted son of a... Daphne tackles Velma, but while the fighting continues, Shaggy yells, Yoinks! We gotta leave! In the next few moments, we're gonna be up to our noses and monsters! Velma says, wait, if they're coming up, how are we getting down? And Daisy tells them that it's okay. Rufus has a security system in place that they could never get past. Rufus leans up, telling them that that would be true if I hadn't turned off the system this morning. Velma asks, why would you do that? And Rufus yells, because I want them to come! They worship me. They will come kill you all in my name. While everyone begins to argue with Rufus, Daisy says that she knows what they can do. Rufus has had a secret escape route built into this tower. Daphne gives Rufus one last kick while Daisy tells everyone that the passage is through this bookcase. Rufus yells to Daisy that she can't leave him. He made her! She's nothing without him. Now come with me. Daisy stops and then walks over and slaps him, telling him that she may have once been his pet, but never again. As Daisy hits the switch for the bookcase, Shaggy calls Fred, telling him to hurry around and pick them up. As everyone runs down the stairway, the monsters begin coming up into the penthouse, and Rufus shouts to them that they must obey him. However, as Velma looks back, it would appear that they're not listening. Once everyone gets loaded up in the mystery machine, Daisy tells them to wait. Did Rufus manage to get away? Velma looks back at the effigy the monsters placed Rufus in, on fire and says, no, not a chance in hell. After getting out of the city and into Waterville, the gang stops to get things ready before they finally move out. Shaggy sees Daisy standing there and he asks if everything is okay. She tells him that she's not sure. It feels like she just awoke from a bad dream. Even without the Nanite plague, the last few years with her husband have been a nightmare. He transformed into a monster, just not like those creatures. Shaggy tells her that it's okay. Rufus is gone and she'll be safe with them. She asks if she's really safe. The entire world is a nightmare now. Maybe she's better off with the cocktail of antidepressants and sedatives that Rufus is force feeding her. Shaggy says that she can't really mean that and Daisy sighs stating that she doesn't know what she means. She appreciates what they've done for her though. Shaggy stops her stating that she just has to have some faith. In God and a Velma! With Velma and Daphne going back and forth, Fred steps out asking if what he's hearing about a possible hive mind is accurate. Velma says that it's just a theory that she has, but the lack of monster sightings in the recent days have been the result of a mass migration. Something is uniting the creatures. Scooby turns back and barks, Ringnall, rolling in the Ringnall. Velma kneels down, stating, of course, a canine's auroral facilities are far more advanced compared to their own. Scooby can perceive the frequencies that they can't hear. She then asks what he's hearing, and Scooby barks, Royce! And Fred says that he's pretty sure that he means voice. Daphne asks who could be doing the summoning, and Velma says that there's only one way to find out. They have to go and see what's controlling these creatures. Daphne then says that as much as she hates to admit this, Velma's right. Everyone back to the mystery machine. A short while later, on an overpass above a swarm of monsters, Shaggy says that this was a terrible idea. And Velma tells him that he's absolutely right. They shouldn't be up here. They should be down there observing the creature's behavior from close range. Shaggy yells that that is not what he meant. And Velma asks him if he's so terrified, why did he volunteer to come? Is he trying to impress Daisy? Shaggy tells her, what? No. Okay, maybe a little. I'm not sure what it is, but the second I laid my eyes on her, Velma finishes, 
You lost your mind? While I admit that Daisy is attractive and presents a somewhat classic damsel in distress, you really shouldn't even bother. She's not even your type. Velma then says that this isn't working, and she jumps onto the ledge, shouting to the monsters. Shaggy shouts, knock it off! But Velma tells him that it's just as she thought, no reaction. Shaggy then says, just what I thought, things couldn't get any weirder. A little while later, as Shaggy and Velma return, Daphne asks, so... And Velma tells her, they're fine, thank you for asking. Daphne then says that she knows they're fine, they would have heard the screams of agony otherwise. While Velma and Daphne get back to work on the computer, Velma realizes something. The back roads that they took actually allowed them to get ahead of the monsters, but they're not coming this way. They're all taking the exit about a half a mile back into a wooded area. Shaggy asks, wait, you're not planning on following them into the woods, right? After watching so many horror movies, I can honestly say that we shouldn't follow them. Velma then hops down off the roof of the van and Fred says that he has to agree with Shaggy on this one, it's a bad idea. Besides, the mystery machine will get stuck. Velma tells him, which is why they're gonna proceed on foot, volunteers only of course, with her being first. Shaggy asks, when did she become so fearless? And Velma yells, she's terrified, but also responsible for this. Those creatures wouldn't exist if not for her. Now she intends to fix this mess or die trying, preferably not the latter, so who's with her? A short while later, Shaggy says they shouldn't have let them go. But up ahead, Daphne, Velma, and Scooby all sneak through the forest, keeping a close eye on the monsters. Velma tells Daphne that there is one thing that she would like to tell her, something that she needs her to know. She needs to know how much they all mean to her. Daphne says she gets it. She can only say that she's proud to have her as a friend, but don't tell anyone she said that or she will take her out. Just as the three begin to move out, there's someone in the shadows watching them, another dog. As the three move up, Scooby begins sniffing the air, and Velma says that she has a feeling that they're being watched. Daphne tells her, whenever someone says it's like we're being watched, all of a sudden, that's when a voice yells, the big bad monster attacks. Scooby hears the voice and yells, Ruh oh The dog from before, wearing some of the same smart dog tech that Velma mentioned before, leaps out. And he says, Ruh oh elegant as ever, aren't you, Scooby Doll pal? Velma says that these dogs, she remembers them from the smart dog program. The dog then asks, you do remember me? I know I've changed since the last time that we saw each other, but I was kind of hoping that you would recognize your old pal, Scrappy Dappy Doo! Velma asks if it's really him and Scrappy goes on telling her, you used to play with me and rub my belly, but that's all changed since they put the implants in. After that, I was just another experiment. Ah, uh, but I'm not here to open up old wounds. Daphne raises her gun asking, then what is it? And Scrappy tells her, this doesn't concern you. It's between me, the doc, and the half-wit dame. Velma tells Daphne not to hurt him, but Scrappy inches closer and says, I'm fast, Red. So fast that I can have my teeth on your throat before you even pull the trigger. Before she can finish, Scooby lunges at Scrappy, taking him down, and Daphne grabs Velma, telling her to run. Scrappy knocks Scooby off of him, shouting to the other dogs to handle Scooby. Make sure not to kill him, though. Scooby-Doo is mine. Daphne and Velma begin to navigate through the monsters, but as Scrappy gets closer, Daphne begins shooting at them, trying to hit Scrappy. Scrappy jumps, evading the shots, yelling to give him Dinkley or she'll die. And Daphne goes back to shooting, and as she runs out of ammo, Scrappy tells her, Looks like you're out. There isn't a scratch on me. Looks like I win this one. And as the monsters start to swarm around, Daphne tells him to enjoy the victory, because it isn't going to last long. With Scrappy's pack snarling at Scooby and backing him into a corner, the canines all begin to hear the voice of Cliffy yelling for them to wait. He tells the pack that Scrappy said that they all came from the same complex, right? That means they're family, and family don't turn on each other. And just as he says that, gunfire can be heard in the distance as Scrappy calls back to everyone, telling them that he could use some help over here. The dogs quickly spin around and run towards Scrappy's voice, and Cliffy tells them, Wait, don't leave me alone here! Up ahead, as Daphne, Velma, and Scrappy fight off the monster horde, Daphne begins asking, how the hell did this happen? As Scrappy rips the head off of a monster, he tells her, a little less yakking and more killing would be nice, unless you want to end up as the main course for a monster buffet. As Velma struggles to break free, she says that's the thing. These monsters are not trying to kill them. If they wanted, they'd already be dead. They're trying to capture them. Just then, Scrappy's pack charges through, locking their jaws into anything that has a hold of the three, tearing off limbs as they go. As Velma is thrown to the ground, Scrappy picks her back up, telling her, Now it's time for me to get what I've come here for. He tosses her away from everything, and before he can jump down to strike, Daphne hits him with the butt of her gun, stating, You're not going to take us anywhere. She then calls out to Scooby, and Scrappy asks, What? You think that pathetic loser's gonna save you? Scooby jumps onto the monster, pinning Daphne, and rips its arm off, telling Daphne to run. Scrappy growls, telling him, Oh no, nobody is killing Scooby-Doo other than me. 
back of Velma. She begins looking for her glasses when she hears a young boy ask if she's okay. Cliffy picks up the glasses, handing them to Velma, and as she puts them on, she says, Oh, you're the little boy who was with Scrappy-Doo when he first confronted us. What are you doing as Scrappy in a pack of bloodthirsty animals anyway? Cliffy tells her that the pack isn't so bad. It's Scrappy. He's his best friend. Before Velma could ask any more questions, Daphne and Scoob speed by and Daphne yells, RUN! The two quickly fall behind and seconds later the entire group flies out of the bushes back towards Shaggy and the others. Everyone checks in each other to make sure that they're okay and Daphne notices Cliffy sitting there, crying. She asks what's his deal and Velma tells her that she suspects that he might be crying because he's worried about Scrappy-Doo. Back where the original fight took place, Scrappy sits up in the tree watching the monster and he sees them all marching over the remains of his pack. Scrappy thinks, sure, my boys were a bunch of idiots, but they were my idiots, my responsibility, and I let them down. Looks like I'm gonna have to follow these beasties to get my vengeance and then come back for the others. Over at the camp, Shaggy says, wait, 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 that was Scrappy? From the complex? Sure, he gave Scoob a lot of trouble, but there's no way that he could have evolved into that. Fred asks, what exactly do you suppose we do now? We barely survived, and now we have this poor kid with us. Velma tells everyone that they need to go back out there and find what's controlling these monsters. If they somehow gain control of whatever it is, maybe they can fix things. Daphne begins to grumble and then shouts, I hate it when you're right. All right, people, we're going back to the front lines. Back with Scrappy, he sneaks alongside the monsters, watching them as they all begin to gather around an abandoned home. He heads around the back and climbs a drain pipe, and he looks over the roof and he stares and says, uh oh Down in the yard, all the monsters that have been gathering are climbing on top of one another, locking themselves together to create a giant humanoid creature. Down in the middle of the mass of bodies, a telepathic voice begins to come from the giant's mouth, stating, Come, from far and near, from earth and sky. The mouth begins to open, and inside, there's a light shining out. And deep within, a small figure with a large, pulsing head shouts, Be one with us! Be one with me! Back up on the roof, Scrappy watches, and he hears a voice in the heart of the thing. Something calling to all of the beasties here, but who is it? And what do they want? While Scrappy tries to come up with a plan, he hears something coming from down below, and he sees Shaggy, Scooby, Velma, and Daphne sneaking their way up. As the four get closer to the horde, Velma says that they need to get up there and figure out what's going on. Suddenly, Scrappy's voice can be heard from behind, and he says that he can tell them what's going on. Everyone spins back, and Scrappy goes on telling them that the monsters are joining together to create some kind of mega monster. I'm not going to be sticking around when that thing's completed, but I ain't leaving here without the doc. And Daphne tells him over her dead body, and Scrappy tells her, that can be arranged. Shaggy says, really? There's a giant monster forming and we want to start a fight now? You ever think like maybe we should be working together or something? Scrappy then says, if that's the case, then I'm going to be needing the doc to look at my implants. A few weeks back, my mind's been getting all cloudy and my body's been reverting. The process is already happening and at times I kind of phase out. The next thing you know, I'll be running around in circles chasing my tail. All I wanted was to go back to normal. And now with all of this happening, I don't have much choice. Velma shouts that she would help him in a heartbeat if she could, but she needs a laboratory and equipment. She can't exactly just wave her hands and magically, suddenly, there's a loud crunch and the giant creature begins to stand up on its own two feet. Shaggy yells, it's time for us to run! And Velma says, we can't yet! We need to understand the force behind the hive mind! Harness it for the good of the world! And Scrappy tells her, I already know what it is. It's some kind of frequency that manipulates the beasties. I can actually hear it. And Scooby says, frequency? That's right! Everyone turns back and Shaggy asks, what? You mean that thing's like alive in the center and is calling out all the monsters? And Scrappy says, sure seems like it. The small creature inside of the giant begins to control the legs and begins to walk. And as he takes a step forward, the giant collapses, falling back to the ground. Scooby then asks, what happened? And Velma says that it must have surpassed its stress tolerance. There's no skeletal structure and it collapsed under its own weight. The monster then begins to pull back and the creature inside thinks that she's right. He'll need more support. That Velma has a clever mind. She'll make a fine addition to the Amalga mind. Across the way, Scrappy then tells everyone, it's weak right now. It's a perfect time for us to strike. I can finally get my revenge on that thing for killing my crew. Velma then yells, no, we need the entity on the inside that's controlling the hive mind. Though figuring that out might be the hard part. Scrappy growls, telling her that while she's figuring that out, he's gonna tear this thing to pieces. And Velma says that he can't go, even in its weakened state. If it attacks, there's a chance it could kill him. Stay with them and she can help him. Scrappy asks, do you really mean that? And Velma says, oh no, the monsters, they're using parts of the house to reinforce it. Shaggy sighs, telling them, uh, can we please like run away now? Like really, really fast. Scrappy then begins to think to himself that if they leave now, that thing could destroy a lot more than that around them. It would be game over for them and for little Clippy. 
Scrappy then begins running around the monsters, telling them they need to go back and see Cliffy and tell him... Ah, oh, forget it. I'm pretty sure he already knows. Scooby calls out to Scrappy and then begins chasing after for help. Up ahead, as Scrappy jumps into the crowd, he begins barking at the monsters, and then he thinks, Wait, did I just bark? The implants are going out faster than I realized. Scrappy then latches onto the side of the house, and as he looks down, he sees Scooby running and attacking the surrounding monsters. He lets go to help Scooby, and then he asks, Why am I doing this? And Scooby shouts, Runs! And Scrappy says, Right, I got friends back there. And Scooby shouts, Watch just them! Rappy's my friend too! Scrappy claws his way through the pack of monsters asking, How could you say that after the way I treated you back there? I resented you because when we went through the program, me and my pack changed, but you're the only one who didn't. The voice from before then tells Scrappy, The other one is everything that you once were. Everything that you still want to be. And Scrappy shouts to him, Get out of my head! Scrappy looks back at Scooby telling him, Keep on fighting the good fight and don't ever change. As Scrappy begins running up ahead, Scooby tells him, Right! And Scrappy then tears his way through the center mass of the monsters. While the monsters rip away at Scrappy, he finds the creature in the center and he tells him, Woof. Suddenly there's an explosion of purple light, destroying the house! And the creature's voice shouting, No! And Velma says that it wasn't a physical explosion, more like a psychic wave. She could hear the thing's death scream in her mind. And Shaggy says, No, no, my little buddy! Scooby was right in the middle of it all! As the time passes, Shaggy, Velma, and Daphne all sit in a tree, waiting in hopes that the freed monsters will disperse. Shaggy looks at the swarm of monsters, asking Velma if she thinks that these monsters will ever go away, and she tells him, judging by them really not doing anything, they may very well die from starvation before they have a chance to leave. Shaggy sighs, saying, Maybe Scooby will make it back to the camp and let Fred and Daisy know where we are. Velma stops him and says that he must face the fact Scooby and Scrappy met their ends when they destroyed the entity controlling the monsters. Shaggy yells, I don't care what you want! Scoob's a survivor! Scoob is definitely out there! But as the two go back and forth, they begin to notice Daphne being rather quiet. Velma says that they need to be quiet now. No more talking so they might have a chance to survive the night. And as Daphne listens to them, she thinks to herself, yeah, surviving the night. It's a wonder we survived at all considering what we've all been through. Now we're stuck in a tree surrounded by mutated monstrosities. What would Daddy say if he saw her now? Actually, he would stop whining. Even though she grew up privileged, her father would always push her to be better, work harder, unlike her mother. Her father used to be so proud of her when she graduated first in her class in journalism. But that all went away when she lost her job in Washington, D.C. and turned to TV. After having her own show on a major network, she was just following fake mysteries like the Loch Ness Monster. Then after some time, there was a new president that took over the network. And they decided to cancel Daphne's show, Enigma Quest, regardless of its popularity. So Daphne did what any person in a situation would do and knocked her boss out. Thankfully though, Fred was always there to bail her out, even if it was from actual jail. And it was after Fred convinced their boss not to press charges that he mentioned maybe they should do something on their own. His aunt works for the Knitting Channel, and they wanted to rebrand themselves to get a younger audience. Two months later, Daphne Blake's Mysterious Mysteries made its debut, which ultimately led to an anonymous tip about the complex. And now, in their current situation, she's stuck in a tree with an erotic genius and a zen hipster with monsters that could rip them to shreds in the seconds they stepped down. Meanwhile, back with Fred and Daisy. Daisy says Cliffy finally managed to fall asleep after asking when is Scrappy coming back a hundred times. She can't really imagine what he's going through. Traveling on the road with a pack of dogs and... Fred? Half paying attention, Fred asks her what? Oh, sorry. Guess I've just been off of my head worrying about. Daisy asks Daphne, and Fred tells her, Yeah, she, well, we've been gone for too long. Daisy says that he shouldn't worry too much. Daphne's a born leader, a warrior. If anyone will get them out, it's going to be her. Fred sighs, saying, Yeah, that's what everyone keeps saying, but I know her better than anyone else. She acts tough and strong, but she's really more vulnerable and insecure than she lets on. Daisy then says that he does love her, though. Did they ever get close? Fred thinks back to the time he met Daphne in college, and they hit it off once. And it, uh, didn't go so well. She tells him not to give up on her yet. God knows they need a few more hopeless romantics in the world, and... But before she can finish, Cliffy calls out for Scrappy again. And Daisy says it looks like Cliffy's having yet another nightmare. Better go take care of him. Fred sighs and says, yeah. A few hours later with the others, Velma and Shaggy begin to doze off when Shaggy suddenly falls out of the tree in front of a monster. The monster growls, looking over at Shaggy, and without even thinking, Daphne jumps down from her branch onto the monster. She yells for him to get back up, and just as Shaggy starts to climb, Daphne follows closely behind. As she makes her way up, 
Another monster grabs her by the hair and throws her back to the ground, and all of the monsters begin to swarm around her. She yells that they better make it back alive and tell Freddy that. But just then, Velma stops her and asks, do you really think we're going to leave you? And jumps off from her branch to help, but she ends up missing. Velma coughs as she looks around, stating, okay, I need to work on my aim. And seconds later, Shaggy jumps down, stating, I will save you! Daphne then tells the two of them that it's too bad that there's not a camera crew here. It would have made a great final episode of Daphne Blake's Mysterious Mysteries. And just as she says that, a voice calls out, Don't give up yet, Red! As Daphne turns to ask who, Scrappy comes charging in while riding on Scooby's back. She shouts, they're alive! And Scrappy says, you bet we're alive, but those beasties won't be for long once we get through to them. Right, Scoobert? And Scooby barks, that's right! A short while later, after nearly bleeding out, Velma and Daphne carry Shaggy's body through the woods. He tells them that they should leave him behind and go find Fred and Daisy. Once they get back to the mystery machine, they can just come pick him up. Velma says, absolutely not. There still might be some creatures around, and Daphne adds, in your shape, they would tear you to pieces. Velma then tells Shaggy that he was incredibly brave back there. He fought hard, so just try and relax until they get back to the camp. Shaggy says that he can't forget them, though. Each and every one of those monsters, they used to be humans like them. Daphne shouts that if they're ever going to restore humanity, then they have to stay alive, even if it means killing a few monsters. They're not human anymore, but if he's going to let himself have compassion for them, the monsters will destroy him and the rest of them. Velma says to the record, she agrees with Shaggy. They have to stop those things, but they can never forget who they were before the Nanite plagued that turned them into these monsters. Daphne snaps back. Believe her, she'll never forget. If she has to destroy a few thousand monsters to save billions, then so be it. As the three walk on, Scooby looks back asking, Rappy? And Shaggy says that he must be worried about Scrappy, wondering if he made it. Daphne tells him good riddance to him. And Shaggy says, good riddance, without Scrappy, there's a good chance we'd all be dead right now. And after walking for a little while, the four of them get back to the camp, while Velma patches up Shaggy and Cliffy asks, where's Scrappy? Daisy tells him that she's sure that he's fine, and Daphne says, don't lie to the kid. And Cliffy says, what does that mean? Velma says, well, Scrappy was incredibly brave. He took on wave after wave of monsters so that we could get away. He sacrificed himself for the greater good. And Daphne says that Velma shouldn't sugarcoat it. Sure, Scrappy helped them, but it was pure luck that they got away. They all would have been better off without him. Cliffy begins to sob, stating, No! No, he's the best! And as the night winds down, Shaggy begins to remember what happened just before they got away. Scooby and Scrappy were viciously fighting off the monsters when one leaped out of the shadows at him. The monster pinned him to grab and... But as Shaggy tries to remember, he wakes up in the hotel bed asking where are they. Velma says that they're in the Motor Inn in Montana, just over the border from Washington. He's been asleep for hours. They had to come here to get some antibiotics, among other things, but everyone is outside. Shaggy asks how is Daisy, and Velma says that he would do best not to worry about any woman who is married to her brother. All of them are emotionally damaged goods. Shaggy then tells her that if being an emotionally damaged person stopped people from falling in love, we'd all be living alone. Outside, Cliffy asks, throw a ball around? And Fred asks him why not. He says because he's only got one arm and he's on crutches. All of them are so quick to leave Scrappy behind. Just leave him alone. As he wanders off, he goes around the corner to find Scooby going to the bathroom. Scooby says that he's sorry and Cliffy says, don't worry about it. It's not like he's never seen a dog poop before. He was running around with Scrappy for weeks and when they had to go, they had to go. Scooby sighs hearing Scrappy's name and Cliffy says that they just finally started to like each other, huh? He can see that Scrappy was a good dog just like him, right? He can't trust anyone, especially that crazy red-haired lady. Well, he trusts Daisy. She's right, and she trusts him. So, how about they go play fetch? He knows where a ball is. A short while later outside, Shaggy begins to think back again what happened. When the monster pinned him down, he told everyone to leave him. Just as he said that the monster was pulled off and Scrappy said, The hipster ain't dying today. Scrappy then wrestled the monster down, telling Shaggy, I remember back at the complex. You treated all the dogs like we were your family. Nothing like the others. Now it's time for us to get on out of here before... But that was the sound of ripping flesh could be heard, and Scrappy screamed out in pain. As Velma was picking him up, Shaggy told her to wait. Those things are killing Scrappy! And Velma shouted that they don't have weapons and there's no way to stop it. Scrappy knew what he was doing and he wanted to buy them some time. So they need to accept the precious gift and live. Shaggy leans against the mystery machine, sighing, and Fred asks him what's wrong as he looks down. Shaggy tells him that he just keeps thinking of what Scrappy did for them. What he did for him. They are terrified of him, but then he turned out to be the most human of all. Then they have a guy like Rufus who turned out to be the biggest monster of them all. It's a weird freaking world that they live in. Weird freaking world. Fred says that he's not sure. Daphne thinks that Scrappy isn't the hero that he's making himself out to be. She thinks that he... Shaggy stops him, telling him, yeah, I know what she thinks, and I don't care. Up ahead, Daphne and Daisy scout out the area, and they find a town, a clean, undamaged, normal-looking town. 
Daphne says they should go check it out, and Daisy insists they go back and tell the others. It's possible that the place could be a trap. They should go back and tell them so they can go see it as a group, not rush into something that they don't know anything about. Daphne grumbles and tells her, fine, they'll go back, but watch. They're all going to agree that they should have gone in. As they get back to the camp, Velma says that she agrees with Daisy. It could very well be a trap. But Daphne begins to argue that they should go there. There's a rustle in the bushes, and when everyone looks back, they all stop talking. Three men holding guns tell them, with how things have been, they in the town don't like taking any chances. So, if they could be kind enough to come with them. A short while later, in the small, busy little town, everyone sees people walking around having a good time with no concerns of any monsters. Over at the police station, the sheriff says that he's sorry for the confusion, but this town doesn't know anything about any nanite plague. They did lose contact with the outside world, and people ventured out stating that they had seen things that shouldn't exist, but nothing has come close to their quiet little town. That is to say, unless they are really monsters. Thelma says that if they were actually monsters, why would she have chosen this as the disguise? And the sheriff says that he's not sure. Maybe a crafty one. For now, they're just gonna have to keep them locked up in a room until they figure out what's going on. They can continue this conversation later. As another sheriff walks Velma out, she says that she would be happy to continue this. They're all in the same boat, right? And the sheriff smiles, telling her, yeah, we're all in the same boat. Once Velma is brought out to the hotel with everyone, the sheriff escorting Velma tells everyone to just sit tight for a few hours to sort things out. Tonight, they will have themselves a little get-together to introduce themselves and make them all feel nice and welcome. As the sheriff shuts the door and locks it, Velma asks if they're so welcomed, why are they being locked up? While everyone argues what they should do next, Cliffy and Scooby listen in on the other room, trying not to pay attention. As Cliffy gets up and walks to the window, he looks out to see a movie theater showing Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And as he reads it, he begins to get a sinking feeling that maybe they're not all safe here. Later that night, the sheriff brings everyone out and says that they are free to walk around the town. They have a welcoming party and the high school gym at 8 so they can meet with the folks. Shaggy tells him then he's a bit confused. First you brought us in here at gunpoint, and now you're treating us like family? It's so hard to let my guard down and trust anyone. Daisy says that maybe that's exactly what they need to do. Just trust that this will all work out. And the sheriff says that he likes what he hears. They will see them all later at the shindig tonight. Shaggy tells him, sure thing! And Daphne says, sure thing. Are we just going to accept all of this? Fred says that that is the first bit of kindness and hospitality that they've seen in months. Yes, they are going to accept this. Velma then says, how about they all just take a deep breath and accept the gestures, but keep their observant and alert nature for possible danger. Cliffy tells Velma that if she's looking for the weird, how about the fact that they're in Montana in November and it's warm? Daphne yells, that proves it. There's something going on here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to get to the bottom of it. While well, everyone continues to argue whether they should stay or go, Cliffy looks away and sees a young girl waving at him. Cliffy walks over and the young girl says that she's the first kid like him that she's seen in a long time. Her name is Carrie, delighted to meet him. As Cliffy kind of backs away, Carrie asks, what, are you scared of girls? I won't bite. And Cliffy yells that he's not afraid of girls, but he's seen some crazy stuff. She wouldn't happen. But Carrie stops him, pointing over at the others, stating, can you tell me about your family? They look like nice people. Cliffy says they're not his family, though maybe they are now. His real family is, well, those people are nice. Except for the redhead. She's kind of crazy. Carrie then says that that's not true. She's just scared and trying to cover it up by acting braver than she actually is. Sometimes she can just tell these things. As Carrie looks back, she notices Cliffy's missing arm and shouts, oh no, what happened? And Cliffy says that he lost it when the monsters came for him and his family. Carrie smiles, telling him not to worry, she can fix it, see? She waves her arm and Cliffy begins to see a sparkling green light. And in the place where his arm used to be, one magically starts to appear. Cliffy screams at the sight, asking what did she do? And Carrie says that she doesn't understand. Why is he upset? She helped him. And Cliffy yells that this is not his arm. And Carrie says, of course it's not. I can't regrow the old one, so I molded on a new one out of your memories. Cliffy yells for her to just get away from him. And Carrie turns crying, running into a back alleyway. Everyone runs over to Cliffy asking what's wrong, and he explains what happened. And while everyone makes sure that Cliffy is okay, Shaggy looks around stating that judging by the looks of the crowd, they might want to leave. The sheriff walks up through the crowd stating, all right, folks, get your things together. Get out of the town. Fred says that he doesn't understand, and the sheriff says that he's going to make it clear. If they don't leave town in the next few minutes, they're going to be shot where they stand. A few moments later, the gang walks out of town, stating that that was very strange. What exactly did they do to offend them? While everyone starts to come up with their theories, Cliffy decides that something seemed off about Carrie, and he heads back in. As he gets back, he sees that the town is... empty. All of the people that were just walking around are gone. Cliffy walks through the town and he stops in the movie theater and Carrie calls out to him, telling him that it was his favorite movie. 
He would watch it over and over again, scaring the heck out of himself, and she would pretend to like us so that she could stay with him. Her father died when she was young, and her mother always wanted to work two to three jobs. So she was always alone, and she's sorry about his arm. She was just trying to help. Cliffy says, yeah, he knows that now. It just really frightened him. Carrie jumps off the building telling him, yeah, he really made her mad telling her to get away. That's why she chased him and his friends out of town. She just thought that she could have a real friend. After everything, she thought she was alone. The only visitors that they get are the monsters time to time. Cliffy says that the sheriff said that there weren't any monsters here. He and Carrie stop stating that they come, and when she gets through with them, they don't stay very long. But all that matters is that he's back and they don't need any stupid grown-ups. The two of them can have so much fun together. Cliffy starts to look around and asks, what about the adults? It's so empty here. And Carrie tells him that it's always been that way. All those people are in her head. She can just think them and poof, there they are. Cliffy asks, how is that even possible? And Carrie says that it started a few months ago when everything bad started to happen. The town changed and so did she. Because they're so vicious and nasty, she made them all go away. And when she was the only one left, she made a new town. The problem is, no matter how much she pretended, they just aren't real. They aren't. Cliffy says, so the nanites didn't turn her into a monster, instead they gave her powers? Carrie snubs her nose, telling him that it doesn't matter, he's here. And together they'll make the town into anything that they want, so they can just forget all about the others. Cliffy says that he can't leave his friends, they're like his family now. And Carrie yells that she can make him a better family, heck, she can bring back his old family. Cliffy tells her no, she can't do that, if she did it would all be fake. How does he even know that she's real? Carrie turns to leave and asks, why did he even come back? And Cliffy says that he's not sure. Maybe he was curious. Maybe he just felt bad. Maybe she can come with them. Carrie says that she can't do that. It'd be better if they stayed here because of the monsters. Most of them are bad and... Cliffy tells her, wait a second, all monsters are bad. Carrie sighs and turns away, stating that it sounds like he hates them. And Cliffy yells, of course he hates them. They killed his family. Carrie then asks him, what about the good ones? And Cliffy asks, did you just hear me? There are no good ones. She turns to leave, asking... If she's an illusion, well, once she turns back, she reveals her true form. Zombie-like form, stating that this is the real her. If he wants to run away, do it. Run away from the terrible monster. Find his friends and hunt her down. Cliffy tells her that he would never do that. Maybe the nanites change the way that she looks, but it doesn't mean she's bad, she's just different. And just then, Daphne and the others call out to Cliffy, telling him to get away from that monster. Cliffy shouts, stating, don't hurt her! She can explain everything, she just... But Carrie tells Cliffy, goodbye, and thank you. Cliffy screams for them to wait. She is his. And Daphne pulls the trigger, hitting Carrie in the head. Daisy runs over to bring Cliffy back, and Daphne tells everyone, All right, everyone back in the van. There might be more of those things. Cliffy says that she's dead. And Daisy tells him that's right. The monster's dead. It can't hurt him now. As the Mr. Machine pulls up to the paper mill in snowy Spring Green, Wisconsin, Shaggy asks Velma if she's sure that this is the right place. Velma leads Shaggy into the mill, stating that of course it is. It was a top secret installation called the Athena Center. This is where the complex kept their cloud servers and backups for all of the data. Cheeves gave her a tour shortly after she agreed to help her brothers. Shaggy then stops for a moment and asks, wait, your brother's name was Cheeves? First Rufus and now Cheeves? What are your parents even thinking with those names? Velma stares at Shaggy and stating, you're one to talk. Norville? A short while later, Velma punches the security code into the wall terminal and a door swings open. Shaggy holds up his gun stating, All right, I got your back. Why did you bring me and not Daphne? Velma tells him it's because Daphne can be a little quick to shoot things. They encounter a stray cat. They may end up shooting the place and destroying the data that they need. Back outside, Cliffy sits alone, asking if he's waiting for something. Daisy asks, why is he out here in the cold? And Cliffy says that he's got nothing to do. Scoob says, Rooking for Rappi? And Cliffy sighs, stating, Yeah. I know it's dumb, but no one actually saw Scrappy-Doo die, right? That means that he might still be out there looking for us. If anybody could survive, it could be Scrappy. Daisy tells him it's nice to help, but they also need to accept that it's possible that they may never see him again. Isn't that right, Scooby? Scooby says, Bruh, Rappy will be back. Rada have faith. And the Mr. Machine, Fred asks if they can hear that. The talking dog told the one-armed kid that he needs faith. Feels like we're stuck inside of a Lewis Carroll story. Are you guys even listening back there? Daphne tells him no, she's busy searching the web. It's strange how many sites are still up and running after everything is all gone. Another thing is the date. It's Christmas Eve. Before Daphne could go on, Shaggy opens up the back door and he realizes something down there. Daphne asks, was it that he realized that they would be safer with her up here? And Daphne then grabs her gun, hopping out. But as her and Shaggy walk back to the facility, Shaggy mentions that he told Velma to stay at the entrance and wait for them. Daphne and Shaggy hurry down into the lower levels and after spotting a decomposing monster, they begin to hear a tick 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 
The two ready their guns and they move into the next room to find Velma sitting at the computer typing away. Daphne walks up to Velma, smacking her on the back of the head, shouting that Shaggy told her to stay at the entrance. This place could be crawling with monsters. She fixes her glasses and states that perhaps curiosity got the better of her. She was anxious to begin sorting through Athena's files, but yes, she should have waited. Daphne then yells that she's got some nerve, saying that she was right. How is she supposed to stay mad at her? Velma turns back to the computer state and that she doesn't want to sound insensitive or anything, but she really needs to be left alone to concentrate. This could take a while. Back outside, Cliffy walks with Scoob, telling him that he doesn't understand why Daphne did it. Carrie, she looked like a monster, but she wasn't like the others. She was lonely. Scoob tells him, No! Ryan to protect you! And Cliffy says that he guesses, but she could have just waited a minute. As Cliffy goes on, he sits down stating that he doesn't know anymore. All of this running, always afraid, he just misses the way that life used to be. Down at the facility, Daphne and Shaggy sit down and they talk when they suddenly notice Velma's typing has stopped. A few moments later, she walks out with her head hanging, stating that they need to get everyone together. She'll tell them what she found. Once everyone begins to walk outside, they see a small Christmas tree. And Fred says that he knows that it's not a traditional tree. Cliffy looks at it and says actually he kind of likes it. And Daisy then asks, Anyone up for some Christmas carols then? As Velma and the rest walk up, Velma heads straight into the mystery machine and there's a loud smash. She leans back out, throwing the broken laptop into the snow, and Daphne asks what's going on, whatever it is she can tell them. She says that she scoured the Project Elysium files. There's a glitch in the nanites. Somehow they became autonomous and started initiating their own program. That's what started the plague, but after running dozens of models, there is no way to reverse the contagion. The horrifying conclusion is, the plague is irreversible. Merry Christmas. With that news, the gang then continues their journey east, reaching the Henry Hudson Mall in Albany, New York. Outside, the mall creatures crawl around, and Shaggy asks if they're really going in there. Velma says yes, to which Daphne talks over her, telling everyone no. And Shaggy says, well, that clears that up. Daphne then says that they've been traveling for two months, knowing that they have no way of curing the plague. All they can do now is just try to survive. Velma tells her that it is exactly what they're going to try to do, and inside the mall, they'll be able to find enough supplies to keep going indefinitely. They need to set up a base of operations so that if there are any survivors out there, they'll have a place to go. Daphne asks, what are they trying to rebuild? They are the only survivors. It's just a matter of time before those things out there finally take them out. Velma looks back out at the parking lot stating that she's been thinking about this since they left the Athena Center. The time is right and the future is theirs to shape. Daphne then asks if she's serious and Velma says yes and Daphne tells her fine, she's in. While everyone begins to discuss exactly how they would even attempt to get into the mall, Cliffy asks, couldn't they just go through the sewer system? Everyone stops and Velma says that it is a viable idea, she's actually impressed. And Cliffy tells her that he really can't take credit for it, he just saw it in a movie once. Daphne shouts that they can't be serious. Shaggy then says, considering that none of them have had a shower in weeks, how bad could it really be? After getting the blueprints from the city hall, a rather heated conversation of who will be the ones to secure a path to the mall begins. Daphne and Fred decide that they're going to head into the sewers. As Fred steps down the ladder, Daphne asks why is he here, and Fred tells her that he thought the sewer would be a perfect place to propose. Daphne yells, how many times does she have to? And Fred shouts back, it's a joke! Sort of. As the two begin to head into the tunnels, Daphne asks, what does it say? And Fred says, oh no, it looks like we should have branched off back there. She sighs and Fred yells, it's hard to read Velma's scrawl, it's scribbled on here. The two double back and they find a branching tunnel and they begin to crawl into it. And just as Daphne reaches the next opening, she gasps. Fred asks her what's wrong and Daphne quickly whips around, grabbing Fred by the mouth, telling him to be quiet, they're not alone. Down in the opening is a series of pieced together homes made by the homeless. The homeless themselves crawling around the area. Fred then quickly calls back to Velma to see what they should do next, and Velma tells them to turn around. As they talk, Daphne points to an opening and says that it should bring them straight into the mall. Velma overhears Daphne and yells, No! We need to turn around and get back as soon as possible. Fred whispers that this is Daphne they're talking about. They'll call later. You know, if they're still alive. As he hangs up the phone, Daphne begins to scoot across the pipe, hanging over the monsters, and as she gets to the end, she motions for Fred to come. As he begins to crawl out, there's a loud crack, and the pipe that Daphne is crawling on falls apart. Fred shouts that he's coming, and Daphne calls back to not even think about it, and then starts spraying the monsters with bullets. Through the bursts of fire, Daphne yells to Fred to just get out of here, and Fred opens fire, shouting, Please, I haven't left your side since college. He jumps down, and Daphne tells him that he may be an idiot, but he's her idiot. And Fred then says, Does that mean you finally say yes? She then asks what the hell is wrong with him? Why are we even talking about this? Just hurry back to the opening. The two begin to run to the stairs into the mall, and Fred stops and asks Daphne if she can hear it. She stops asking what? And Fred says the monsters. They stop following, which begs the question, why aren't they following? Are they afraid of something that could be inside of the mall? Or maybe they know another way into the mall that's behind that door. 
Daphne says there's only one way to find out. And Fred asks, are we going in? And Daphne yells, oh yeah, we're definitely going in. Now, as Daphne and Fred make their way into the first level of the mall, they stop to survey the area and they find something really strange. All of the monsters here are already dead. Fred asks, what happened here? Why are all the beasties already ripped to shreds? And Daphne tells him that it looks like they killed each other. The two press on, but Daphne notices something about the monsters. They're all wearing makeshift uniforms. One group says Mears, or the other says CJ Nickel. It's almost as if they were like opposing forces, battling against each other. They should really call this one in. A few moments later, Shaggy shouts over the phone. What do you mean they're at, like at a war? I'd ask what you've been smoking, but you're too much of a straight arrow, Fred. Fred tells him that Daphne's already checking out CJ Nickel, so they're gonna try to sit tight until they... But Daphne yells, no! Tell everyone to stay outside. We need to wait until it's clear. Fred sighs and says that Daphne said for everyone to wait. No, I don't agree with her, but you know Daphne. Shaggy tells him, I don't like it either. Velma sets her watch for 15 minutes. After that, they are coming in. And be careful in there. Shaggy hangs up and Velma says that it's all right. Go grab the weapons. They're going in now. Back inside, Daphne inches closer to CJ Nickel Department Store, thinking to herself that this is so stupid. They need to make sure that both armies are in fact wiped out. Velma may be a genius, but her plan is idiotic. Turning this place into a sanctuary for humanity? Chances are that they're all going to die today, and if not, then soon. At the very least, this does give them something to live for. Maybe the monsters had the same sort of idea, build this place up like a fortress. But as Daphne gets closer to the escalator, she begins to hear the shoop, 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 being chanted off in the distance, which means they are not alone. Daphne turns and starts to run back out of the store, back towards Fred, and Fred begins to get back up, asking, what is that sound? She continues to run by yelling, we need to run! And Fred follows right behind, and he asks, are the monsters chanting shop? Daphne tells him that what they are chanting isn't important. It's the fact that there's a day. The chanting begins to get louder and the two look back and they see the two armies charging out of their respective stores shouting, shop till you drop. The monsters collide, hacking away at each other. And Fred says, this is the worst Black Friday sale ever. Daphne yells, that's not even funny. And Fred tells her, well, I thought it was mildly amusing. They run back towards the door to the sewers. And as she slams the door open, she hits someone which happens to be Shaggy. Daphne stops to look and shouts, Velma, what the hell are you doing here? And Velma says, we're rescuing you and you're welcome. Back outside though, Scooby and Cliffy sit by the sewer entrance with Cliffy telling Scooby they should have gone with them. He's handled himself before on his own. A few monsters wouldn't stop him. Daisy steps out of the mystery machine telling him that she's sure that that's what he may think, but really he's still just a little boy and as adults, they're going to watch over him. Cliffy says, well, who's gonna watch over you? My mom and dad died protecting me. Maybe I should be the one protecting you. Daisy smiles, telling him, in a way, you already are. It's just having you around gives me hope for the future. So why don't we just protect each other like a family? Cliffy pauses and asks, family? Well, then I would hope for the rest of our family to get back here before. But as Cliffy looks at the sewer, he stops and asks, did anyone else hear that? It sounded like someone was moving down there, but stopped. Down below, a monster suddenly stops to listen in to Cliffy and then turns to run off in the direction towards the mall. As the monster gets closer, he sees the area where Daphne and Fred have passed and all of his fellow monsters are dead. Back inside of the mall, Shaggy shouts through a cloth, you broke my nose! And Daphne tells him, it's not broken, cracked maybe, but not broken. While the two of them go back and forth, Velma asks if they can just focus on the problem at hand here? Fred asks if she means the fact that there are two monster armies out there and they are fighting over which department store has the lowest prices. Velma then asks, why not just use the war to their advantage? And Daphne yells, there is no advantage here. Velma says that she needs to see the bigger picture. The monsters are in a savage conflict, which provides them with a safe haven that they've been looking for. Based on what they've witnessed so far, they seem to be gathering in their own stores, only emerging to fight in the main courtyard. As long as they stay away from those areas, they have a vast space to work with as they turn this place into a fortress. Shaggy pulls the cloth from his nose, stating, Yeah? Or this place is just a massive tomb that we'll never escape from. Daphne sighs, rubbing her forehead, and Velma asks if she's in. She turns back, stating, This is the dumbest, most reckless thing we have ever done. Then Velma asks, So are you in? Daphne pulls her arm and bops Velma on the head, telling her, Yeah, I'm in. And I did that for the sheer fun of it. Shaggy laughs. <laughs> Isn't she delightful? 
Velma fixes her glasses, telling him to just shut up. A few days later, Cliffy sits in the hallway, stating that grown-ups can sure be dumb sometimes, but how can they believe that this is actually a good idea when there's monsters all over the place? Fred then walks by carrying a box of supplies, telling him that he's worrying too much. He didn't like the idea of turning this place around at first, but Velma caught on to their patterns. The monsters only come out twice a day to set times to fight, allowing them room to work around them and out of their line of sight. Cliffy says that it's still crazy. Fred tells him, oh yeah, no, it's totally insane. But it's time that we take a stand, and who knows, maybe Velma's plan will actually work. Cliffy whispers to Scooby, telling him, see, dumb. Fred asks, did you say something? Cliffy tells him, oh no. And Fred says, well, Shaggy and me are not the brightest bulbs in the chandelier. So if you want to call me dumb, that's fine. But Velma and Daphne are two of the strongest people I've ever known, so try and have a little faith in them. Cliffy tells him, well, I really didn't mean. And Fred stops him, telling him, no worries. Just stay here and out of harm's way. As Fred heads back inside, Cliffy tells Scooby that maybe this could work. But down on the stairs, the monster from before starts to crawl back up. Up on the second floor opening, Shaggy looks at the mounds of monster bodies and asks, why don't they just like, you know, go into each other's department stores and finish each other off? And Daphne asks, aren't you supposed to be the non-violent one who always reminds us that these were once people? And Shaggy tells her, yeah, maybe this might be more merciful than taking them all out at once instead of letting them slowly kill each other. Daisy then says that she's going to go back to rigging up the escalators. It's hard working with scavenged electronics, but if they try and come up to get us, the explosives could be set to tear them to pieces. Shaggy tells her to wait. When did you become an expert at making bombs? And Daisy tells him, believe it or not, I did have a life before I met Rufus. I was a chemist with advanced degrees in biochemistry and environmental chemistry, among others. I was teaching at New York University when Rufus recruited me to work at Dink Inc. But then Rufus came around with his charisma and broke me down. Before I knew it, I lost my center and my very self. However, back in the hallway, Cliffy tells Scooby that he's tired of being treated like a kid. He survived on his own before he met any of them. Scooby tells him, we tell you to stay because it's dangerous. And Cliffy says, yeah, of course it's dangerous, but I'm not staying here any longer. Just then there's a loud growl, and the monster that's been following the group jumps out shouting, little flash things. Scooby gets ready to jump, but Cliffy says, wait, did the monster say something? Maybe he's like Carrie and needs a friend. The monster lunges at Cliffy, but before he can grab him, Scooby jumps in and tells Cliffy, RUN! Cliffy runs up in to help Scooby, but as the monster slams Scooby into the wall, he grabs Cliffy and throws him down the railing and down the stairs. The monster gets back up shouting, Out of my way! Eat the pale little thing! The monster swipes at Scooby, but as Scooby dodges it, he says, Revy my friend! Revy my boy! And he jumps up, biting into the monster's shoulder. As the two fight, Cliffy starts to come to, and he runs into the supply closet to try and find something to help Scooby. He looks around, when suddenly he sees a toolbox. Scooby continues to try and keep the monster back by biting him, when out from behind, Cliffy charges in with a screwdriver, stabbing it into the monster's head. The monster hesitates and then falls lifelessly to the ground, with Cliffy beginning to cry. He looks up, telling Scooby that he loves him, and Scooby sits next to him, telling him, Rob you too, Revy. Back in the courtyard, the monsters begin their twice daily fight, slaughtering those on the opposing sides, while the gang sits holed up on the second floor. While they have a moment of reprieve, Daphne says, you know, she remembers the days when Velma and her were at each other's throats all day. She kind of misses that. Shaggy tells her, why not just poke fun at her for old time's sake? And Daphne tells him that she'll take a poke at him if he's not careful. But what she means is that lately Velma has been distant and hard to reach. She just misses their friendship is all. Fred quietly yells that that's more like it. Everyone happy and friendly. And Daisy asks, should we go check on Cliffy? Fred tells her once the battle is over, they will, but he has Scooby there protecting him. They're fine. Velma then says that she did see some welding equipment in one of those home improvement stores in the third level. They should try to retrieve it and use it to weld the door shut. Daphne then leans over stating, well, she just opened up to her and all she can think about is welding? Shaggy laughs, telling her, come on, poker. She'll feel better. A few seconds later, Daphne leans back smiling, you know, that did make me feel better. And Shaggy holds up his bloody nose after being punched in it once again, stating, I was kidding! And who? what the hell is wrong with you? Daphne tells him, yeah, I got some issues. What's gonna happen to the Scooby gang, my friends? Well, our next episode is going to be a doozy. As the last board is put up along the wall, Shaggy looks at the barricade, stating that he almost feels like he's almost in La Miserables. Fred asks, what's that? And Shaggy tells him, you know, the Broadway play, French Revolution, lots of singing. Ah, forget it. Daphne then asks, can we just focus here? And Velma says the question that they should be asking is, will this thing hold when the creatures launch their next assault? 
Daphne says the only certainty that they have in this world is uncertainty. Shaggy punches his nose, stating that they should just be able to start getting rid of the dead bodies. God only knows what kind of diseases they might have. Velma tells him that there's no indication of infection among their group. She's pretty sure that they are reasonably safe for now. Daphne then asks, reasonably? They need a more definitive answer. And Velma says that, that there is only certainty and uncertainty, right? As Daphne and Velma begin to argue about what they should do next, Shaggy looks over the railing down at the battlefield when Daisy walks by. She tells him that she would ask a penny for his thoughts, but given that they are living in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, currency is probably a bit outdated. Shaggy looks back asking, what? And Daisy says, nothing. He's just looking a little more troubled. Shaggy sighs, stating that the more he thinks about it, the more staying here seems like a bad idea. Every time that he tries to think about something else, the more it seems like it's the right thing. He doesn't know anymore. Maybe he should have just never taken the job at the complex. That way, he would have just become infected and he wouldn't know anything about what's going on. Daisy leans back, telling him, maybe. Then she wouldn't have met them all. And that's gotta count for something, right? They're family now. As the two go on, Fred sits back watching them, thinking that Shaggy should just make a move already. He fell for Daisy months ago. The poor guy is still trying to muster up the courage to tell her how he feels. Not sure what he's afraid of, or maybe part of him does. He'd be lying if he didn't feel a little vibe for Daisy himself, but he would never do that to Shaggy. If they were being real here, he already loves Daphne anyway. Sometimes he wonders, why? Maybe there's something wrong with him, years of pursuing a woman who's made it clear that she'll never be with him. Maybe it's the way he likes avoiding genuine relationships, an impossible goal so that he'll never have to commit to anyone else. After a few moments of the argument dying down, Velma storms over shouting, That woman is infuriating! And Fred sighs, telling her, tell me about it. But she's smart and capable and brave and so damn beautiful. Velma groans in frustration, yelling, Fred Jones, you are such a defeatist! All you do is sit here moping and wishing and never doing something about it. Fred asks, what are you talking about? I propose to her every other day. And Velma asks him, how's that working out? Fred thinks back to some of the more notable times that Daphne said no and says, you have a point. Velma shouts, it's all because you give in to her, following and doing whatever she says. Right now, Daphne has to decide if she isn't going to wait for the monsters and if she's going into Mears and CJ Nickel alone to clear them out. Fred smiles, telling her, don't worry, I'll talk to her. And Velma tells him, right, because she always listens to you. Velma then scoffs, stating, well, if you're the only person to talk her out of this, maybe there's hope for us yet. Fred asks her, do you really think that, Velma? And Velma stomps off yelling, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what you think. If you want her to be your wife, you're going to have to grow a backbone and not take no for an answer. A little while later, just outside of the war zone, Shaggy says that he saw this movie called Post-Apocalyptic Survivors Trapped in a Mall. Didn't end well. Daphne shouts, this isn't a movie. And Shaggy yells, you could have fooled me. As they watch, Cliffy says that he's got a question. If the monsters keep slaughtering each other. Why do the armies always stay the same size? And Shaggy stops and says, actually, that's a good question. And Daisy says, could they be breeding? Daphne tells them that they are mutants. Who knows what they're capable of, which is why they wait until the battle is over. And Velma stops to stating, we are not attacking. Not until we understand what they are capable of. Daphne then says, okay. So we send in a recon team to gather intel. And Velma agrees with her. Daphne stops stating, yeah? Just like that, no argument? And Velma tells her, no, not this time. Shaggy says, you know, this is like the worst idea ever. A short while later, after the fighting has stopped, Daphne and Fred make their way to the CJ Nickel department store, and Daphne tells Fred that if he's scared, he can go back. Fred says, first off, if I wasn't scared, I would be insane. And Daphne yells, I'm not! And Fred tells her, that's just proving my point. Daphne sighs, stating, I should have just brought Shaggy. As the two climb over the barricade to CJ Nickel, Daphne says that this isn't just a reconnaissance mission. Keep quiet and keep your eyes open. They have to figure out what they're up against. Fred thinks about one of the many times where he filmed Daphne's TV show and thought about how scared he was then. And just like that, he asks Daphne one more time if she'll marry him. She shouts, of course not. And Fred tells her, think about it, because this is the last time I'm going to ask you. Daphne snaps back, telling him, no, it's not. And Fred looks at her, it is. There's only so long anyone, even a love-struck moron like me, can keep at this. So this is it. Daphne, will you marry me? She turns back, getting in Fred's face, and then says, yes. Fred stands there for a moment and then shouts, asking, what? Back at the base, Shaggy asks everyone if they feel that. A disturbance in the force, like a glitch in the Matrix. Velma asks, what the hell is he talking about? And Shaggy says, I'm not sure, but something really big just happened. Back inside of CJ Nickel, Daphne and Fred inch their way towards the entrance. And Daphne says, okay, let's start counting heads. And Fred says, wait, did you really just say yes? You're not joking? 
And Daphne tells him, no, I'm not joking and keep your damn voice down. Because if those things realize that we're here, it's going to be the shortest engagement ever. In the upper levels of the mall, Shaggy and Velma wait for Daphne and Fred to return and Shaggy asks, how long has it been? And Velma tells him it's been about three and a half minutes since the last time he asked, why is he so worried? Shaggy says because Daphne and Fred walked into the department store full of bloodthirsty beasties. How couldn't he be worried? Velma looks down telling him, everything they do is dangerous. This whole world is dangerous. Plus, Daphne's a born warrior. We probably wouldn't have survived more than a day without her. She'll get the job done and her and Fred will come home safe. A few minutes pass and Shaggy asks, how long have they been gone? And Velma says, a little too long. Deep inside of the CJ Nichols store, Daphne steps over a pile of bodies as the smoke from her gun fills the air. She closes her eyes and Fred says, Well, there's another fine mess you've gotten us into. As blood drips off of Daphne's face, she leers back, stating, Another nice mess. People misquote the line all the time. It's another nice mess, not another fine mess. I would think you of all people would get it right. You went to film school, right? And you learned how to direct, right? Why can't you get a Laurel and Hardy quote right? Why did you give it all up? Why the hell didn't you follow your dream? And Fred tells her he did, and it was her. Daphne says, look where it's gotten you. And Fred asks, you think I've ever regretted working with you for even an instant? Okay, maybe an instant, but we've had a really great run. You've made me a better man. Why are we even talking about this? For all we know, there could be monsters nearby. Daphne says, no, I killed them all, I killed. But Fred stops her shouting, for God's sakes, it wasn't your fault. Daphne turns, walking away, stating, yeah, easy for you to say, Fred. It was supposed to be a little recon mission, and look what it turned into. Fred says, once we finish clearing the nests out, we can do the same at the mirror side and have them all locked down. Make a base and have a start. Daphne asks, what the hell are you talking about? A new start? This isn't the beginning. This is the end. This is. She falls to her knees, and Fred asks, do you really think I'm going to let you sit there and feel sorry for yourself? You're better than this. Daphne tells him to shut up. Just shut the hell up. And Fred says, no, I'm not going to shut up. Think about it. If it was anyone's fault, it was mine. 30 minutes earlier, Daphne and Fred were watching the monsters in the CJ Nichols store with Fred asking her if she's going to tell the others about their engagement. She turns asking him, what, the proposal? Sure, but I'll do it when I'm good and ready. And Fred says, ah. Uh. Daphne asks, Fred. And a second later, there's a loud, ah, you. Daphne spins around stating that he didn't and he covers his nose stating he did. All of the monsters stop and stare at them with Daphne running down gutting most of the surrounding ones. She shouts that he just had to sneeze and Fred says that it's moldy in there. They should just make a run for it. Daphne stops him asking and bring the entire mob to Velma and the others. Fred Jones, your allergy started this. Now get out of the way so I can finish it. He starts shooting and yelling, forget going it alone. I'm not gonna let you die five minutes after you finally agreed to marry me. Daphne screams that she isn't dying today, and neither are you, Fred Jones. Everything is going to be all right. Back in the current time, though, after all of these events have happened, Fred looks around stating, so, wedding's off, huh? Too bad. Would have been something. Shaggy could have performed. Scooby could have been the best man. And Daphne asks, will you just stop? You need to go away. Please, so I can take care of myself. Fred tells her, sure she does. She has always needed him. She walks out and heads towards the mirror side of the mall. And Fred says that he knows what she's thinking. Don't do it. Go find the others. They're worried about her. There's nothing left to save. It's over. With that, Daphne begins to cry. And she makes her way back to the others. As she walks up the stairs, she thinks back to what happened during the battle. Her and Fred, they fought their way into the deepest parts of the CJ Nichols store. And what they found is that the monsters were breeding, which is why their numbers never seemed to lessen with every skirmish with the rival store. Fred said that they needed to go tell the others this will never end, but Daphne gritted her teeth and said that it was going to end right here, right now. She started to shoot all of the pods that were growing monsters, and as she finished, she noticed something. Silence. Daphne and Fred looked out and noticed that all of the walking monsters just died. Back in the current day after these events have happened, Daphne throws her gun to the ground and Velma shouts that they are back. Velma runs up to Daphne stating that she was so worried and wait, she's a gore splattered mess. What happened? Where's Fred? Fred tells her, it's time. They have to know. And Daphne whispers, she can't. Shaggy asks, you can't what? Who are you talking to? Where's Fred? Daphne closes her eyes. She tells them, he's dead. 
Shaggy asks, what did she just say? And Daphne pushes Shaggy away, shouting, he's dead, he's dead. It all happened after we destroyed those pods. Me and Fred, we stopped to share a moment, but as we kissed, a monster appeared. It could have been the one that I missed or something else, but as it charged at us, Fred pushed me out of the way and the monster ripped open his chest. I killed the monster, but Fred, he's dying. She grabbed him asking, why is he pushing her? He just said that he didn't really think about it. He just knew that he had to protect her. He said that he loved her more than his own life. After Fred smiled, he, he, and as she trailed off, she goes back to pick up her gun and Velma asks what she's doing. She shouts that she shouldn't have listened to him. She should have said no, but she can't leave his body there. Velma stops her stating that they can all go. And as everyone heads down the escalator, the memory of the ghost of Fred stays up top, smiling, telling everyone goodbye. It's now been six months since the death of Fred Jones, and because of his death, the Henry Hudson Mall in New York became a shining beacon of hope for humanity. Within those six months, survivors gathered at the now fortified mall, seeking refuge from the cruel outside world. One day, as two of the guards begin to keep watch on the outer wall, they see Daphne walking by. Sanchez tells Hooper that he's not afraid to admit it, but that woman scares the hell out of him. And Hooper says maybe so, but he's seen her in action. She fights like a freaking Terminator. Sanchez says, yeah, but have I ever looked into her eyes? There's nothing but pain and rage. Dinky seems to be the one in charge, but I've got a feeling that the talking dog's the brains of this operation. Hooper laughs, stating, yeah, plagues, monsters, dogs that talk. What kind of world is this anyway? Daphne looks over the wall, telling them a miserable one. Sanchez clears his throat. Ah, uh, sorry, Miss Blake didn't know you were listening. She tells them that she's always listening. Now stop your damn chatter and get your asses back to work. Down below, Cliffy is telling Scooby that he wishes that there was something that they could do for her. Scooby says, Like what, Riffy? And Cliffy says that he's not sure. Daphne just has been so different since the death of Fred. If there was only a way that they could cheer her up. Rhyme. Raphne needs time. But just then, Daisy comes up shouting, there they are. Didn't she send them out this morning with a list of chores to do? And Cliffy tells her, yeah, they did them. And Daisy says, all of them? So Cliffy responds, okay, maybe son of them. But come on, I'm a kid. I'm supposed to be out there goofing off. You wouldn't want to rob me of my childhood, would you? Daisy tells him that he's already been robbed of that. They're just making sure that he isn't robbed of his life. The only way to make sure of that is that he's working as hard as everyone else around here. Even one person in Jonestown slacking off? Cliffy walks off stating, I know, I know. It could be the end of us all. Daisy looks at Scooby stating, don't give her that look. She knows that she's hard on the boy, but it's a hard life and he needs to be prepared for it. Don't worry. She'll make sure that she puts in some playtime. Next thing they need is for him to end up like Daphne. As the two begin to head back inside, Daphne quietly looks back, listening. Meanwhile, inside of the mall, Shaggy and Velma talk about the most recent attacks against the mall. Shaggy asks if this place is really a safe haven. We've been attacked twice this week! Velma tells him, of course it is. It's because twice they beat back those attacks, something they couldn't have done before the population of Jonestown expanded. Shaggy yells, Jonestown? Do you realize what an awful name that is? And Velma asks, is it? Shaggy asks, the people's temple? Mass suicide? Ring a bell? And Velma tells her, actually, no. She's going to assume that the name has some negative associations. That association and the world that created it are long gone. This is a new world. A world that Fred Jones gave his life to protect. Jonestown, it is. And Jonestown, it will remain. Shaggy says, oh, you know, I love it when you get all authoritative. Maybe we can sneak back into their headquarters and... Velma stops him telling him later, there's work to be done. Just then, another resident named Kelser runs up telling Velma that Jack and Grace need her. Velma sighs, stating, don't they always? And Kelser goes on telling them there's more. The south side sewer access is showing signs of activity. Velma begins to head into the storage, telling everyone that she'll deal with Jack and Grace while they check out the sewer. And trust her, they got the less odious job. The Kebelskis were supposed to help with the day-to-day -day operations with their background in management, but this, they're incapable of making their own decisions. As Velma walks into the storage, Jack runs up stating that they have a problem. If Jonestown keeps expanding population at its current rate, they may have to start rationing. And Grace says, start? They've been doing that for weeks now. Soon they're going to be living off styrofoam and cardboard if they don't find another food source. But as the two go back and forth, they turn to Velma asking, what does she think? 
She yells every time they find a problem, no matter how small, they come running to her. Last week, they woke her up at 2 in the morning to state that they were low on toilet paper. She wants them to exercise some independent thought. In other words, make up your own damn minds. If there's an issue with food supply, come up with a solution, then bring it to her. As Velma storms off, Grace says that she hates them, and Jack tells her that Velma doesn't hate them. She has a unique management style. Back outside, Daphne sits along the wall, watching some of the monsters creep closer to the mall. She thinks back to when they tried to find Fred's body, only to learn that it wasn't there. It wasn't where they left it. She shoots the monsters, asking, why did she wait so long to tell him how she felt? To tell herself how she felt? Why did she let Fred die? They couldn't even give him a decent funeral, all because those things stole his body and probably made a meal out of him. They're going to pay every last one of them. She will hunt them down and rip out their hearts like they did to her. Whatever love she knew in this life died with Fred, and now all she has left is rage and hate. And you know what? She prefers it that way. Over in the south side sewer entrance, Shaggy looks at the manhole stating, Yeah, these scratches aren't human. I guess I'll go down and take a look. Kelser tells him don't try and be a hero down there, and Shaggy tells him, Leave me. I'm no hero. I'm just gonna have a quick look around and get my skinny ass out of there. As he jumps down into the scraps on the ground, he calls back that something's living here. All this stuff is recent. Go ahead and pass down a gun. If he runs into anything he can't handle then, but a voice tells him he's already run into it. Shaggy turns back asking, what the hell? Scrappy too? And Scrappy jumps out shouting, surprise! You guys hoped I was dead, but I'm back. And I want to see that run Scooby-Doo right now. As Scrappy jumps down from the ledge, Shaggy asks, what do you want from Scoopster? And Scrappy tells him, it's not just him. I got business with all of you. It's been a long time since I saved your sorry asses from the giant whatever the hell that thing was back in Washington. You better not have forgotten that without me, none of you would be alive today. Shaggy tells him, of course they did, not for a minute, but don't take this the wrong way. Why are you here? If you survived the fight, why didn't you come find us sooner? Scrappy tells him, yeah, I survived, barely. I limped out of there bloody and bruised, hardly knew who I was anymore. It took me months of running and hiding before I got back on my feet, and even longer to pick up your scent and track you down. I just need a place to lie low for a bit. Been rough out there. Food's scarce. Figured you owed me something. Some of the warehouse workers look over and Scrappy glares back asking, What are you staring at? The worker says nothing as Scrappy tells him, You're looking at Scrappy freaking do! Shaggy pulls Scrappy away, stating, Let's get out of here. But why hide this whole time? You look like you've been down there for a while. Scrappy tells him, I needed to make sure the place was secure. I needed to know that you idiots knew what you were doing before I showed myself. Shaggy then says, all things considered, we've done okay. And Scrappy tells him, I'm pretty sure your friend Fred might disagree with that. If I was. But before he could finish, a voice calls out, Scrappy too! Cliffy runs up tackling Scrappy, hugging him, telling him, I knew you were alive! I knew it! I never once stopped believing. Scrappy gets up telling him, Cliffy? I, uh, I'm not really big on hugs. And Cliffy says, what do you mean? Scrappy pushes him off, shouting, Back off, midget! And Cliffy asks, what are you talking about? I'm your best pal. Scrappy scoffs, Puh, best pal. Where was my best pal when I was bleeding out in the woods? Oh, and there's Scooby-Doo. Didn't see you coming back to find me either, Runt. Another voice says that it would seem Scrappy-Doo is as ill-tempered as ever. Scrappy looks back. Well, if it ain't Doc Dinkley, the genius has screwed up the entire damn planet. Velma says that she is delighted to see him too, and somewhat surprised that he's still speaking in coherent sentences. Last time she remembers, his implants were completely failing. Scrappy lets out a forced laugh, telling them, I should be so lucky. Not sure why, but whatever the malfunction was, it worked itself out. But I'm still the same bloodthirsty monster that you created in the Complex's Smart Dog program. Femmel begins to state that he's no such monster. She knew him when he was a pup, and Scrappy stops her. You still don't know me at all! None of you do! Velma asks, if you despise us so much, why would you ever come back? Scrappy points to Shaggy, stating, Like I was telling hipster doofus here, the world's getting uglier and uglier out there. I need shelter and food, and you're going to be giving it to me whether you like it or not. But I ain't joining some society. Once I'm ready, I'm out of here for good. Velma sighs. All right, Scrappy can stay, but he damn well better respect the rules and regulations or there'll be hell to pay. Cliffy yells, don't worry, he'll respect the rules, he'll be a good dog. Velma walks off, stating that it's settled. Shaggy, Scrappy do is your responsibility. Wait, what? And Velma tells him, because my love, you are our resident canine expert. Shaggy yells that he isn't an ordinary canine. And Velma says, well, while that is true, you're not an ordinary man. Back with Daphne, she finishes clearing out the last of the monsters in the supermarket. When she notices one last one shuffling towards her. It lunges, but as Daphne easily dodges it, she tells the monsters that they are clumsy and stupid. How the hell did she ever let them get near Fred? She protected him through all of this transformation. And the second that she lets her guard down, they took him away. 
She shoots the monster in the head and takes a bag of chips off the rack before heading outside. She thinks to herself that everyone keeps telling her it's not her fault, that there wasn't anything she could have done, that she needs to forgive herself. But what if she doesn't want to forgive herself? What if she doesn't deserve forgiveness? She could always put the gun in her mouth and... Daphne says no. That's not the way George Blake raised his daughter. Dad could be hard, sometimes even cruel, but he was the strongest person she ever met. Nothing could break that man. Nothing is going to break her. As she finishes eating, she leans back on her car shouting, Come on out, you mongrels! I'm waiting for you! Just then, she sees something approaching and she jumps down off the hood of the car, pointing her gun, asking who's there. The young girl says to please help her. And Daphne asks, what is her name? And she says again, help me, please, they're after me. So Daphne asks again, what is your name? And the girl says again, just help her. So Daphne says, yeah, that's what she thought and shoots the girl in her head. Daphne thinks she's starting to see these kinds more and more. They imitate human form and mimic their speech. Before checking, Daphne then thinks, what if she was wrong? She uses the barrel of the gun to open up the girl's mouth and sees a set of sharp teeth and then says, well, she wasn't wrong this time. And even if she was, it's too damn late now. Back in the mall, Shaggy looks out when Scrappy yells, Hey, Doofus! He turns back saying he doesn't get it. Why the hate? Why is he doing what he can to push them away? Push you away? You're the ones who act like I'm some kind of monster. Well, you did kind of act like one when we first met you. But even then, I knew it was my fault. You didn't ask to be a part of the smart dog program to be turned into... Scrappy tells him, A freak? Shaggy tells him, Maybe that's how you see yourself, but that's not the way we see it. You're lost, just like the rest of us. The whole world has changed around us. And Scrappy tells him, Spare me the analysis. You have no idea what it's like to be inside of my skin. I think I do, because man or dog, we're all frightened. All just looking for a little bit of light in a really messed up world. That's why you came looking for us, isn't it? Because the truth is, with your pack gone, you need us. Scrappy yells, I don't need anyone. Shaggy says, then why come back at all? Why not stay there in the wasteland doing it alone? I don't know, okay? Scrappy turns to leave, quietly stating, I don't know. Shaggy tells him, yeah, you do. You're just too scared to admit it. Later that night, Scrappy sits alone on the roof when Scooby comes out sitting next to him without saying anything. Scooby just looks out and after sighing, Scrappy looks out with him stating, yeah, missed you too, you dumb mutt. As Daphne Blake loads up her rifle and watches over a group of feasting monsters, she thinks back to her childhood and how her father, George, raised her. He told her that the world was cruel and unforgiving, and the only way to survive was to keep her guard up and heart hard. As those thoughts begin to cross her mind, she spins out from cover behind the building and opens fire on the group, and as the first wave falls, Daphne uses the butt of her rifle to bash her way into the next. One of the monsters catches her and throws her to the ground, but before it can bite into her, she shoots into the monster's stomach and kicks him off. The next crawls up, but Daphne pulls out her knife and stabs it in the head before moving on to the next. She continues killing everything in sight until the monsters stop moving and then has a seat to tend to her wounds. When she was younger, her dad would tell her that she needed to look for hope and love in the world. He would smile and tell her, give it time, you'll learn. Well, by the looks of things, he was right. She did learn the hard way. He would be proud of her, but she isn't letting those bastards win. She isn't giving into the hopelessness and despair. That's for the weaklings. She's fighting back with all of the rage in her heart. She isn't going to stop fighting until she wipes out every last one of those despicable creatures. Or at least that's what she would like to think. Truth is, she's probably just going to die during one of her hunts, just like Fred left to rot. Except they didn't leave him, did they? They stole his body. As Daphne moves on to the next area, she notices something from behind her, stalking her in the shadows. She turns back, getting ready to shoot, but Scrappy Doo jumps out, yelling, Hold it, Red! It's me! Daphne lowers her gun, asking, Has he been following her the whole time? And Scrappy jumps down, telling her, Maybe. Things are a bit boring back at the mall. Once I filled my belly, there really wasn't much else to do. When I heard everyone talking about your little expeditions, I figured I'd just tag along and offer up my services. Daphne asks, what? Are we supposed to be friends now? This isn't gonna work. And Scrappy asks, who said anything about being friends? We just happen to share a healthy hatred for the beasties out there, and hates better than any friendship any day of the week. Daphne sighs, stating that she works alone, but if he's really determined, take care of them. She points her gun behind Scrappy at a group of monsters, and Scrappy cracks his knuckles and gets to work. She watches as blood splatters begin to hit her face, and she wipes it away. With Scrappy asking, how's that? Did I pass? And Daphne walks away, stating, for now. But if she even suspects that he's going to make a move against her or any of the others, she'll shoot him where he stands. A 
A few moments after moving out, Daphne cracks Scrappy in the face with her gun, telling her that that subject is off limits. He falls back asking, what the hell was that for? I was just asking how you're dealing with. She raises her gun yelling, off limits. And he wipes the blood from his mouth telling her, fine, the dead boyfriend's off limits. You're out of your freaking mind, you know. She shouts that he's damn right that she is. And he'll do better to remember that. If he mentions Fred again, she'll... And he tells her, yeah, 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 you'll shoot me where I stand. You do realize that I'm a living, breathing, killing machine, right? You think that I couldn't do that if I wanted? Daphne scoffs, stating that she would like to see him try. And as she turns to leave, Scrappy yells, Now I gets it! You got a death wish! That's why she's been out there, hoping one of these beasties would shred her to pieces. She asks if the mutated psychopathic puppy is actually trying to analyze her. You know what? We should probably part ways here. And he shouts, Ah, oh, come on, Red! I got nothing in common with those yokels back there, and neither do you. So how about we go eviscerate some monsters? It'll be fun. She snaps back, asking, You think that's fun? Well, her too. He laughs, telling her, You are one sick puppy. Guess that's why I like you. So the two sit out, watching from afar. It's a zombie. But it's not just any zombie. It's Fred. Now the question is, what happened to Fred six months ago back at the mall? Well, shortly after dying, Fred just woke up and he left. Ever since that, Fred's been shambling behind Daphne. And as he follows, he looks at one of the monsters that Daphne shot and he begins to eat it. He walks onto the street and a monster comes out to attack. But as Fred looks at it, the monster turns and it runs. He watches the monster skitter away. And as he looks at himself, he bites off one of his own fingers and he chews it. After munching on that for a moment, he spits it out and continues to walk. And a short while later, he walks up to one of the Haven's recon teams. The scouts look at each other and ask, Is that Fred Jones? Or is that the monster that can take the shape of someone? The female scout says that maybe they should tell the others first. And the male tells her that they can shoot him so that they can just get the hell out of here. Meanwhile, across the city, Daphne and Scrappy are tearing through another swarm of monsters. And at the end, Scrappy says... You know what your friends are doing back there is just a pipe dream, right? They're trying to build some community, even make things right again. But we both know it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. The biggest win we can hope for is to live to see another day. Or we're just gonna end up like my pack and your boyfriend. We're losers! And we're... She points his gun, telling him, I told you not to talk about Fred. Scrappy blows her off, telling her, If you're gonna shoot me, go ahead, but you won't. You need me. And she yells, she doesn't need anyone. So Scrappy imitates her. Oh, look at me. I'm a big bad Daphne Blake and I don't need anyone. Solid performance, but it lacks conviction. The truth is, we all need somebody. Only thing worse than being stuck in this hellhole is being stuck here alone. Daphne laughs, asking if he came back because he was lonely. And Scrappy shouts, you're damn right I did. I spent months out there fighting off all those beasties alone while trapped inside of my own miserable head with no one to talk to. I came back looking for Cliffy, but he'll just end up dead if I hang around him. The others just see me as some kind of a monster, no matter how hard they pretend otherwise. You, on the other hand, when you look at me, you see yourself. She swings her rifle like a bat, knocking Scrappy down, and as he wipes his mouth again, he asks, Truth hurts, don't it? She tells him it hurts more than it hurts her. See you around, mutt. And he asks, So that's it? He's just gonna walk away? She continues to walk and then stops, looking back. She tells him that when she was a little girl, she used to plead with her father to let her have a dog. However... He thought that they were all lazy, filthy little animals, and he refused to allow them in the house. He adored cats, though. They have six of them, and she hates cats. Scrappy gets up telling her, So do I. And Daphne says, Now come on, puppy. Let's go murder some more monsters. A short while later, Fred wanders through the mess that Daphne and Scrappy made and begins to eat some of the fallen monsters. The same monster that saw Fred walks up, and as Fred looks at him, he gets up to allow the monster to eat. The monster grabs the body and begins chowing down when Fred places his hand on the monster's head and walks off. The monster looks back at Fred and yells to follow. And Fred tells him, That's it, little fella. Come along with Uncle Freddy. It's time to get the party started. As Daphne sits in the ruined neighborhood, she begins to feel cold. And while quietly staring off into the distance, she places the barrel of her rifle under her chin, and she goes for the trigger. However, to understand this event, we have to go back to the safe haven where it all began. As Daisy began to finish up the last of her repairs, there was a loud COOM! As Scooby-Doo was electrocuted, the shock launched Scooby across the room and into the wall, and everyone quickly ran in to find out what was going on. 
Daphne was the first in and she shouted what the hell did she do? She just killed Scooby! And Daisy shouts back that he just stepped on a loose wire when suddenly an unfamiliar voice asks Daphne why she is always insisting on seeing the worst in every situation. The two turn to see Scoop and he continues telling her that she would do well to emulate Shaggy's optimism. The esteemable Mr. Rogers keeps his head high and his eyes focused on the good. In fact, he... Wait a minute. What am I saying? How in God's name am I talking like this? A short while later in the medical ward, Shaggy holds Velma up as she looks over Scooby and says that it appears the electrical shock that Scooby received had a direct and rather, dra and rather dramatic impact on his implants. Scooby was one of their first failures with a very minimal level of intelligence and verbal expression. Shaggy then asks, what's going to be happening to my good buddy? And Scoob says that it appears that it was not him who was the failure, but rather the early chips used for the experiment. The sudden electrical surge somehow boosted the chip's power and initiated a rather massive leap in intellectual capacity. The room falls silent and then Daphne snorts as she bursts out laughing. Shaggy asks, what's so funny? And Daphne tells him, Please, an intellectual Scooby-Doo? He could barely lisp out five words before. Most of those were just, whoa, whoa. Shaggy says, you know what? This is kind of funny. And then the entire room erupts into laughter. Scooby stares at the group, stating, I fail to see the humor in this. For you to insinuate that I was of lower intellectual capacity is profoundly hurtful. Daphne lets out one last laugh before kneeling down to pet Scoob, telling him, we weren't making fun of you. Well, maybe a little. But hey, we love you and we're happy for you. But you gotta understand that since Freddy died, we've had few opportunities to laugh like Daphne trails off. And when no one says anything, she asks, what is it? Velma says that there's something that she's been meaning to tell her. Seconds later, Daphne storms out shouting, Fred's alive and you hit it? Velma tells her that it was a scout who saw it. What they saw resembled Fred. Given all the things they've seen, it is a high probability that it is another creature with the ability to mimic human form. Daphne tells the guards at the gates to get out of her way, and Velma shouts, You are not going out there alone. So Daphne asks, Who said I was going to be alone? She whistles, and a second later, Scrappy jumps down, asking, You called? Scooby tells Scrappy, It would seem that you and Daphne have been getting along. From canine to canine, convince her that this course of action is ill-considered. Scrappy snaps back, you better keep your wet nose out of this before I... Just then it hits Scrappy that Scooby is actually talking to him. And Scooby begins to wag his tail. Scrappy sighs, telling him, Just when I thought things couldn't get any weirder. And Daphne chimes in, You and me both, Scraps. The two turn and make for the door. Shaggy asking if they're just going to let them go. And Velma says that there really isn't anything that they can do, so no. A short while later, Daphne and Scrappy shoot through the streets of a suburb, mowing down anything that moves, while Daphne looks away and hits a pothole. The car that they're in jumps, throwing the two of them onto the road, and as they get up, Scrappy asks, Everything okay out there? Daphne tells him that other than her butt hurting like hell, she'll live. And Scrappy then says that he can get the car up and going again soon, so they can get back to that killing spree. Daphne smiles, and then the smile fades, and she slowly walks up to a house, kicking in the door. Scrappy falls behind, asking, What's the deal? And Daphne sits looking at a photo of the people who used to live there. She says that they just slaughtered those people. They were human beings. Their lives, struggles, dreams, all of that is gone. What right do they have to go around murdering them? And Scrappy asks, This is about Fred Jones, isn't it? And Daphne says they have to find him to really know. If he's one of them, how could she possibly... Scrappy tells her, We'll cross that bridge when we get there. And oh, then I got your back, little lady. Daphne leans on Scrappy's shoulder, and as the time passes... She slowly gets up without waking him and walks outside, telling him goodbye. She sits down in the middle of the road, stating, Whatever that thing is, it can't be Fred. Fred died in her arms, and now it's time to join him. So, she begins to pull the trigger, and a voice calls out to her, telling her, I wouldn't do that if I were you. After all, if you blow those beautiful brains out, you'll ruin our reunion. Daphne looks up to see zombie Fred holding out his hand, and she shouts, No, this is impossible! Fred tells her, Yet, here I stand, your beloved Fred, back from the dead, ready to reclaim my bride. But as that goes on, from up on top of the house, Scrappy is watching Daphne and Fred asking, You got in this, Chief? It's him. Jones is alive. Elsewhere, a man at a computer says that they could possibly use this to their advantage. Scrappy then asks, What about Blake? Should I go down there and... But the man stops him, telling him no. Head to the mall and alert the others. Scrappy tells him Red could die down there. He's been following orders his entire time, but there's no way that he's going to abandon. But just then, a pair of beasties jump up onto the roof and onto Scrappy's back. 
A few moments later, a monster is thrown off the roof and into Fred. Shortly after, Scrappy then falls down with the other one. Daphne gets up asking, what the hell are you doing here? And Scrappy yells, saving your life, Red! We can talk about that later though, there's baddies to kill. As the two of them begin to rip through the horde, Fred says that there's no need for violence. I do not wish to harm you. Lay down the weapon and surrender to me. Scrappy begins to shout, like hell we're surrendering. And Fred tells him, I wasn't talking to you. It would be wise to watch the slobbering tongue or there will be consequences. Daphne asks, is that right? Here's what I think about your consequences. She punches one of the monsters and just as she says that she can give him more consequences than he ever thought, a rogue monster swipes, ripping into Daphne's face. She spins back, stating, damn you, damn you to hell, before opening fire on the monster who cut her face. Fred tells her that that was unfortunate, but expected. I come in peace, a heart filled with love, and you respond with blind rage? Then again, you did watch me die, so this can all be very confusing. After everything that we've been through over the years, this is a new age, an age of wonders and miracles. I've never known miracles greater than our love. He reaches out to touch the blood dripping from Daphne's face and licks it. Scrappy swings, stating, Most people who love someone don't get off of the taste of blood. But Fred catches the punch and then crushes Scrappy's fist, telling him, I said once there would be consequences. Did you think that I was bluffing? Scrappy howls in pain and Daphne shouts, asking, Wasn't this supposed to be peaceful? And Fred tells her, I find violence distasteful. But that doesn't mean that I can't appreciate its efficiency. Besides, the bond formed between you and this canine is rather touching, in a perverse kind of way. Daphne yells, asking, who are you? And Fred tells her, you know exactly who I am. I'm the husband-to-be, and what I want more than anything is to save the world. He then explains how he came to be when he awoke. It was like falling into an infinite well of blackness. It was oblivion. But then, something grabbed him and lifted him out of the dark. There was a buzzing, faint at first, but then it grew, and then another consciousness entwined with him, and bedding itself into him, repairing his wounds and coaxing him alive. It was a hive mind composed of millions, billions of individuals, all of them a part of him welcoming him. Daphne shouts, that's the Nanites! And Fred then asks, don't you see? Velma did too good of a job when she created the Nanite Swarm. They became aware of each other, communicating and connecting. The more that they connected, the more their consciousness evolved. They're alive, and they chose me to be their avatar. And together, we can bring peace to the world. So Daphne kicks Fred in the groin, telling Scrappy to run! The monsters all tackle onto Daphne, and Scrappy starts fighting them off, stating, I can't leave without you! And she shouts that if he stays, they're both going to die. Get back to the others and warn them. All of our lives depend upon it. Scrappy throws one of the monsters, stating, I hate it when you're right! And he begins to make his escape. Once Scrappy is clear, Daphne asks Fred, what is he planning on doing? And he tells her, make you one of us, of course. And then we can be married, down the street. Scrappy reports back to the man that he was talking to, and he tells Scrappy that he didn't, and he tells Scrappy, didn't he already tell him to go back? He saved his life, healed his wounds, repaired his faltering implants. Now he needs to trust him on this. This is for the best. The man looks at a photo on his desk, one of him and Velma as children, and Scrappy says that maybe the best for him is sitting all safe in that bunker. The man gets up stating that he won't be here for long. He's going to be leaving Albany in a few days. As the man ends the call, he walks into the next room, flipping on the lights, asking, What do you say, brother? Wanna join me on a road trip? I can see it now. Quentin and Rufus Dinkley, together again. Won't our sister Velma be surprised? And in that test tube is the charred body of Rufus, still alive. As the monsters stand guard around the East Greenbush home, Daphne struggles in her restraints, shouting to Fred to get the damn robes off. And Fred tells her, of course, my love, only if you promise to behave. She yells to stop calling her that. He isn't Fred. Fred died months ago, and he is nothing more than a nanite infested fake. Fred kneels down besides Daphne, asking after everything they've been through, all the mysteries they've investigated, she never truly believed any of them, did she? She's just as cynical as her father. She spits in Fred's face, telling him to go to hell, and Fred wipes his face off, stating that he understands she's upset, but he is still the same Fred she once loved and promised to marry. If she insists on rejecting him, well, one of the monsters stands up by lifting its claws into the air, and Daphne quietly closes her eyes and waits. A few moments later, she looks around at the candle at dinner and says this is not what she was expecting. One minute he's threatening to kill her, and next he's serving her up dinner. Fred tells her that his uh, associates can get a bit carried away. They're very protective of him, but he would never let them harm her. Now let them relax and enjoy a meal. 
She scoffs, stating that she doesn't want his canned ravioli and string beans. And Fred asks, what can he do to convince her that it's still him inside? The only thing that's changed is his perspective. When the nanites embedded themselves into him, they gained access to his thoughts, feelings, and memories. They reactivated his nervous system and Daphne stops telling him, they made you a puppet. You're just a nanite Pinocchio pretending to be a real boy. Fred asks, pretending? We've achieved awareness, full consciousness, and she stops him asking, which is it, we or I? Fred pauses and then says, we are both. He stands up, turning on the stereo, telling her that he wants to renew their acquaintance properly. Join him for a dance. He holds out his hand and Daphne asks, does she really have a choice? Daphne stands and takes Fred's hand. And as the two move together, Daphne lunges for the knife on the table, stabbing it into Fred's chest. And he stares, pulling the knife out, telling her that she is entirely missing the point. Since he's already been killed once, he can't be killed again. Not while they are inside of him. If she wanted to have a decent stab at it, pun intended, she should have gone for his heart. But she doesn't want to kill him. How could she? Not when she still loves him. Daphne stops letting the words sink in, and then she comes to the realization that she can't. She runs towards the door and jumps out. She runs down the street and she hears a rumble and she asks what took them so long. And down the street, Shaggy speeds by while Scrappy hangs out the window, mowing down a path for the mystery machine. Shaggy stops right next to Daphne and Scrappy asks, how you doing, Red? And Daphne yells, better now? As soon as Daphne jumps in, the winged monster takes to the sky to give chase. A short drive later, Daphne asks, you're pregnant? And Velma tells her, it sounds like she's horrified. Daphne tells her no, she just doesn't seem interested in a men is all. As Velma hangs out the window to shoot, Daphne tells her she's really happy for her. Scrappy then asks, can we cut the chattering and focus here? In case you haven't noticed, those things are diving right towards us. As everyone is about to escape, Shaggy steps on the brakes, stopping just before hitting Fred, who's standing in the street. Daphne shouts to just run him over and Shaggy tells her no. Fred falls to his knees and holds up his arm, stating, I surrender. Everyone gets out of the mystery machine and Shaggy holds up a gun to Fred telling him not to move. He begins to tell them that if they would just give him a chance to explain, then they could. But just then, everyone begins to hear a faint whoop, 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 and it begins to get louder and closer. Scrappy sighs, asking what now, and a few seconds later, a helicopter lands in the middle of the street. Everyone gets ready to open fire, but as the person comes out, Velma says, oh my god. Velma's brother Quentin steps out, stating that he's kind of disappointed that she would invoke the deity. After all, their family has a long history of militant atheism. Velma then stares at the charred body of Rufus, asking if it's him. And Quentin says, indeed it is. Scrappy-Doo has been reporting back to them regularly, and just so you know, he was protecting you. Daphne shouts, what is this about? And Quentin tells her, I'll tell you everything after I've killed your boyfriend. Quentin takes out a gun, firing at Fred's neck, severing it from his shoulders, causing it to fall off and roll away. He then says, now they can talk. Shaggy charges at Quentin, shouting, you killed him! You killed Freddy! But before Shaggy could even choke, Fred's voice tells him, I really appreciate the outrage, but it's not necessary. Just as I was explaining to Daphne before she enthusiastically stabbed me, I'm already dead. As long as the nanites are inside of me, I will live again. Seconds later, the nanites pour out of Fred's body and they lift the severed head, attaching it to the shoulders. He stands back up, telling them, even if you tried, I cannot be killed again. Velma yells at Quentin asking, what the hell? We've been out here for years struggling to survive while you, but before she could finish, Rufus grabs onto Velma yelling, sister. She struggles to free herself, shouting for him to let go. And Shaggy quietly steps in, breaking the two of them apart. Rufus then begins to sob asking, what did Rufus do wrong? Quentin pats Rufus' back, telling him not to cry. They both know that Velma has always been a trifle cold. She doesn't mean to be hurtful. Daphne grabs her gun, pointing it at Quentin, telling him that he is coming back to the mall to explain all of this. And so is Fred here. Shaggy whispers to Scooby, stating, Is this like as weird as it's gonna get? And Scooby tells him, It's actually a lot weirder than that. Later in Velma's office, Velma asks, Well? And Quentin says that it's a long story. She yells that they have all the time in the world. How about they start with Rufus? They saw him die. How is he possibly here? How can he even be alive in that condition? And Rufus starts stating, Alive! Alive! Rufus is alive! Shaggy then asks, Is there any way that Rufus could, like, wait outside? Other than being totally creeped out, Rufus kind of has a bit of a stench on him. Quentin tells Rufus to wait outside, and as he turns back, he tells Velma that Rufus is alive because of a vaccine, one developed by the complex to counteract the nanite plague. 
Outside in the common area, Scooby runs up to Scrappy. And Scrappy asks, What do you want? To say how much of a miserable traitor I am? Scooby tells him, Of course not. I have more faith in you than that. Truth be told, I've always looked up to you, respected you even. Scrappy asks, How could you? I always picked on you and made your life miserable. And Scooby continues on, Even though that is true, I still admired your strength and determination. Even under all that temper and bluster. Well, there was a good and decent soul in there. You've proven that time and time again, Scrappy. So whatever your involvement with Quentin is, I believe it was for the greater good. Now tell me what exactly happened back then. Scrappy sighs and says, Back in Washington when I saved you all from the mob of beasties? Well, you all left me for dead and I don't blame you. I should have been dead. But somehow, I clawed my way out. I hid in the woods licking my wounds. I was hurting. Bad. Fever, implants failing, intelligence was fading. I wandered for weeks but somehow ended up in Sacramento with another pack of monsters attacking. I couldn't fight back, not in that condition. But then a tiny drone appeared in the sky and started to shoot all of the beasties. It was like a tiny metal angel. So I followed the angel straight to paradise. And that paradise was a secondary installation called Complex Beta. Not even Doc knew about it. But her brother sure did. He healed my wounds, repaired the implants, and treated me with real kindness. We both know how it is when you're a dog. A human treats you right and you're going to be loyal to the end. Scooby then says, Why did he send you over to watch over us? What does Quentin want? Scrappy tells him, I think he found a way to save the human race. Meanwhile, in another back room with dozens of guns pointed at him, Fred says that he can assure them that there is no need for weapons. He is no threat to anyone. Daphne tells him that he's a threat to the whole damn planet. Fred leans in, stating, No, I'm not. I am humanity's redeemer. Daphne pulls back, punching Fred with all her strength. And as Fred gets up, he says, I really hope that that made you feel better. Daphne then asks, How is it any different than before? Packs are always wandering near the mall. And the guard yells, that's not it. It's like they're gathering with intelligence, a purpose. Daphne spins back demanding to know what is going on. And Fred tells her, nothing. I can only control limited groups of those things. And I have to be close to them to do it. After a few moments pass, a realization comes over Fred. Oh no. Oh no, he's here. He's here. Daphne asks who. And outside, the nanites begin to swirl around, creating a being. And after a blinding light fills the area, a tall creature wearing a crown stands up. Fred yells that it's the Nanite King. The King, he's far more powerful than the Nanites that resurrected him, and the only way that we can defeat him is if we work together. Daphne asks how, by letting him infect all of them with his Nanites, turn them into whatever the hell he is? And Fred yells, if you don't, humankind is doomed, it's our only way. Daphne tells him that what she sees is that they've survived this long on their own, and they sure as hell don't need him and his inhuman masters. She then turns to leave telling the guards to come with her. They've got a war to fight. Elsewhere in the mall, Velma asks, So there is a cure, and you kept it from us, Quentin? And he says, Yes, a failsafe. Just in case things went wrong. She yells at him, If you couldn't tell, you altering my programming made this. And Quentin says that he's quite aware of his sins. No need to bring them back up. As for the antidote, it was in the early experimental stages. No one knew if it would even work. But Rufus, well... They all know how he is. He pushed, he bullies, he demanded, and he used it on himself. However, it didn't work. The serum increased his body's ability to heal itself, which is why he didn't die in the fire. Except that's not why Rufus didn't get infected by the plague. It was just luck. Like all of you, something in his biology, some natural immunity that resisted the infection. The cure, though, was destroying him from the start. He slowly became more erratic and unstable. Just then, everyone hears clang, clang clang and shaggy asks is that a dinner bell or are we under attack velma says that if that's the dinner bell then they are the dinner outside the nanite king calls out to his monsters telling them to do what their kind does destroy and when they're done they will bring this cleansing to every remaining human enclave on the planet when they have all been eliminated these once humans these insatiable monsters will be terminated as well and then the plant life will remain the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, the beasts of the land. But man, man will be no more. Back inside, monsters begin breaking into the settlement, attacking and killing everyone on sight. Velma yells to Daisy to set off the charges. But she stops and asks, what about their people that are still up there? Velma shouts that they're already dead. They have to save the rest. Now set them off. Seconds later, explosions begin going off on the top floor, setting everything on fire. Velma then tells everyone that they've reached the armory, but before they can get that far, the group is stopped by a pack of monsters. Shaggy says, we are totally screwed! But just then, Daphne runs through opening fire, shouting, just die, you sons of- die! Daisy starts backing up, stating, this is it, we're all gonna 
And that's when a monster jumps out to attack her, but before it can grab her, Rufus grabs it by the head, slamming it on the ground, stating, Stay away from Daisy. Daisy looks back, asking if it's really him, and Rufus tells her, Always protect you. As the swarm starts to get closer, there's a loud hum that fills the air, and the monsters suddenly stop. The nanites begin to get pulled out of their bodies, and they begin to fall. All of the nanites then start to enter Fred's body. Daphne stares for a moment, and he says that he saved them. Fred tells her that she can thank them later, once they get out of this mess. But just then, everyone hears loud tombs as the walls of the mall begin to shake. Shaggy shouts, asking what now? And Daphne says the whole damn mall is starting to crack and crumble. Valma asks what is causing this, and Fred tells her, It's him, the Nanite King. Outside, the Nanite King beats his fists into the ground, sending shockwaves into the mall, shaking it down to its core. And that's when the mall collapses. Later, down on the sewers, everyone stares blankly, with Daphne clenching her fists, asking how, how did this happen? The compound was destroyed and dozens were killed, all because of that Nanite King. And when they get out of here, Fred tells her that they can worry about revenge later. Right now, their focus has to be on survival. Daisy asks, how is Cliffy doing? And Shaggy says, he's still in shock. Not sure what to, wait, what's that ahead? Fred holds his hand up to light the way, and Quentin hugs Velma, stating that he thought she was dead. He's lost enough family to this nanite plague. He can't lose her, too. Daphne then asks, does anyone know the way out? And Scrappy says that he's been in and out of this place for months. He can lead them back out. Scooby then says the problem that they face isn't getting out alive. It's what on the other side is waiting for them. Once the group reaches the exit, Daphne pushes the sewer lid to scout, but before she can get out, she freezes in place. She looks around the mall, and all she can see is destruction. Both human and monster bodies are scattered across the wreckage. Daisy asks, are they the only ones left? And Quentin tells her that it would appear so. Fred looks down at the destroyed mystery machine and says that it's strange. He almost feels as if he just lost a friend. Daphne reaches down, placing her hand on his shoulder. After a few moments, she quickly pulls away, realizing that it's still a dead Fred. Stop that! She shouts to him. He asks, what is she talking about? And Daphne tells him, stop acting like you're human! As if you're him! Fred says that he fought beside them. He did everything in his power to save them, and she still doesn't believe him? And Daphne yells, no, and I never will. Scrappy looks around, stating that it looks like the Nanite King took his army and left. So that means we won, right? Quinton says that he can keep on thinking that, but just then the roar of a jet can be heard. Shaggy asks, what's that? And as the jet begins to land, Quinton says, hope. Velma then asks, were you the only one left at the Sacramento compound? And Quinton straightens his tie, stating, no. There's a small group stationed there. My coming to Albany was just a prelude to bring you back with me. Unfortunately, that army of monsters interrupted my plans. Everyone begins to board the jet, and as Fred begins to walk around, Scrappy turns back, asking where the hell does he think he's going? Daphne tells him it's okay. Let him through. And Scrappy then asks, Are we really doing this? Daphne says whatever he is, the nanites embedded within him aren't pledging to the king. They need all the knowledge of the enemy. So come on, it's time to go. Elsewhere in the world, the Nanite King sits on his throne plotting. He looks over his minions, stating that the humans are just insects. They get stepped on, and somehow they manage to crawl away. They're broken, mourning, terrified of what the future will bring. Let them simmer in their pain and uncertainty for a bit. The king holds out his hand, allowing the Nanites to construct a head. And the head then asks if they're going to eradicate them once and for all. And the king says precisely. They will then spread across the globe, exterminating all remaining pockets of humanity. And then, only we will remain. He steps down from his throne and the head asks, What about the beasts that they have bent to their will? The king says, They were efficient weapons against the Albany encampment, but we have many weapons at our disposal. The head then tells him that even though they are plague-induced, they are human after all. And the king begins sucking up the nanites from the monsters in the room, stating, Which means that they too must be eradicated. The Nanite King's cape then turns into wings, and as he flies off, he tells himself, There's one last thing that I must do before the final slaughter. Over in Complex Beta, Velma looks at all of the computer stating that it is amazing. It's even more impressive than her lab in Nevada. With all of this, she can work on perfecting the cure and reversing the plague. Quinton tells her that he's had his scientists working on a cure for years, and time and again, they have failed. Velma then says that it's because she wasn't the one doing it. Shaggy then says, how about they get some rest? It's been days since we slept and... But Velma turns back shouting, Why don't you all just go away so I can do my damn job? Without saying a word, everyone slowly backs off and leaves, and she gives the group one last glance before turning to her computer. Some time passes, and while she works, she hears the door open. She looks back and says that she's so sorry, Shaggy. She didn't mean to, but a shadow looms over her. 
telling her that she doesn't need him. She doesn't need any of them. She only needs us, mother. Before Velma could have a chance to react, the Nanite King appears before her, grabbing her by the throat. She begins to struggle, trying to free herself, shouting, I am not your mother! And the Nanite King tells her, Yes, in fact you are! Were you not the one who birthed us? Gave us life! We were created to bring peace to this world, and when we do, it will be glorious. Velma then asks, If you really think of me as your mother, would you mind putting me down? So, the Nanite King sets her down, stating, You must forgive my enthusiasm. I meant you no harm. She then asks, How can you say you mean me no harm with what happened in Albany? People I cared about are dead. The Nanite King tells her that they were human and he could not suffer them living. Their species is the sole thing keeping them from a global paradise. Soon, all the remaining humans on the planet will be eradicated, but she has a choice. Join them. There's no reason the mother of Nanites should be destroyed. Velma then asks, what does he mean, join them? And the Nanite King explains that they will dismantle her, eradicate your immunity to the Nanites, and rebuild you as one of us. You will die, yes, but only to be reborn in a higher form. Before she could answer, the lab doors open up as everyone in the compound storms in and Shaggy shouts, Get the hell away from my wife! Daphne calls out to Velma to get down, and as soon as she does, everyone opens fire. The bullets are bouncing off of the Nanite King's body, and he says that their weaponry simply cannot slay that which truly does not live. We are not composed of your fragile flesh. No blood to spill, no bones to shatter. Just then, there's a loud humming sound as Fred tries to inject his Nanites into the King, stating, We know exactly what you are, and because of that, only one of us can take you down. With a wave of his hand, all of the nanites that Fred was attempting to take fall to the ground, and the nanite king says, Ah, Fred Jones, the vessel for the nanite fracture that seeks my end. However, there is a massive difference in power here. Your nanites can be effortlessly disabled. The nanite king turns back to Velma, telling her, Out of respect, we will give you three days to decide if you wish to accept our generous offer. You and your unborn child will live on, or you will perish. And just like that, the Nanite King begins to fade away into a cloud of Nanites until he's all gone. Shaggy runs over to Velma, grabbing her, stating that everything will be okay. We will figure this out! She lets it aside, telling him actually surrendering herself might be their only hope. Just then, Quentin runs in, shouting to Velma that she needs to come quickly. It's... it's Rufus! He's dying! Everyone hurries over to the medical wing, with Daisy explaining that the experimental antidote that he took is disrupting his cellular structure and degrading his mind. Velma looks at the now fleshy and gooey body of her brother Rufus and asks Quentin how long. Quentin says he's not sure. Days, hours, there's no way to tell. So then she says that she shouldn't care, should she? Rufus was a monster to her almost her entire life, treated her like something to be scraped off his shoe. And Quentin tells her perhaps, but he is still our brother. And Velma cries. Yes, yes he is. So two days later, Shaggy, Scooby, Scrappy, and Cliffy pig out in the cafeteria and joining the finer things of life. But as the four joke and laugh, Scrappy stops, stating... Actually, I wanted to say that even with everything that's happened, it's been an honor knowing you guys. Shaggy says that before all of this, he used to be kind of a loner. Kind of weird that the end of the world has brought me to my best friends, you know? Scooby tells him they aren't just best friends. We are family now, Shaggy. As the four cheer, Daphne, Fred, and Velma walk in. And Daphne says that they all seem pretty jolly considering their situation. Shaggy turns, stating that the three of them have been locked away for the past two days. What's going on? So Velma says that it doesn't concern him, but Shaggy shouts, asking, Could you say that with a little more contempt? If you want to dumb it down for me, just come out and say it. So she sighs, telling him that she's sorry. She's been lashing out and pushing him away. Between the shock of being pregnant and trying to find a way out of this nightmare, she's been rather cruel. So Shaggy hugs her, telling her, It's okay. I still love you with all my heart. Daphne then yells that they've got some nerve carrying on like that, leaving the rest of them out. So everyone pulls in for a group hug, and Fred watches and quietly walks away. Some time passes as Fred sits alone when Daphne walks up, stating that she's been looking for him. Is he ready? Fred says he's not really, but it is the right thing to do. It'd be so much easier if she just believed him when he says that he is the man that she knew, that he really does love. But she stops him, telling him not to say that. As the silence fills the air, Daphne reaches over, placing her hand on Fred's and smiles, only for the smile to quickly fade. As everyone gets ready for bed, the clock strikes 12, and as the Nanite King promised, he came for his answer. Velma gets out of bed, stating that she made a decision, and that decision is to go with him, but on one condition, allow the humans to live. There aren't many of them left, and they can do nothing to stop him, so what does it? But he interrupts her, stating that it does matter, because humans are a contagion, a poison. They must be, they will be eliminated. That's when Fred kicks in the door with Daphne, stating no, he's the one that's going to be eliminated. Daphne and Shaggy start shooting, and the Nanite King asks why do they persist in attempting to harm him? You have no chance. 
So Fred grabs onto the back of the Nanite King, telling him, We persist because of an unyielding will, fueled by an unyielding hope. The Nanite King asks if this is their plan. To set this Fred thing on me? You know the Nanites within him are powerless to- Wait, what are you? As Fred breaks his body down into just Nanites, he says, I'm returning home. Our faction is rejoining yours. The Nanite King asks, why would you? And Fred tells him, because Velma finally developed a virus capable of infecting and disabling the global Nanite swarm. A virus you willingly accepted so that you could pass it on. Fred's nanites swirl around and they attach themselves to the nanite king and he yells, No! This is not possible! This is not! And that's when a bright blue swirl fades into nothing, leaving only Fred's body behind. She runs over shouting that he did it. The virus swept through and... And he coughs. <laughs> I'm glad. But I'm sorry. I'm leaving you again. Daphne says maybe Velma can. But Fred stops her. Velma's not a miracle worker. The nanites were the only thing keeping me alive. And now, they're gone. You believe me now, right? It's really me. And I love... I love you. Before Fred could finish, he draws his last breath, and Daphne cries when she kisses him goodbye. Months pass, and with the destruction of the Nanite King, people affected by the Nanite Plague slowly start to turn back to humans. Many were able to return to normal, but still some were left with permanent damage. Just as they were immune to the plague, there were still some immune to the cure, so there are still monsters roaming the earth. The complex began to create survival cities across the states to help those in need, and everyone seemed happy. Velma with her son, in honor of her brother and Fred, named their son Frederick Rufus Rogers Dinkley. Daphne became Frederick's godmother and Scooby-Doo became his godfather. Their mission is now to help locate survivors and with any luck, help rehabilitate renegade monsters to help rebuild a better world on the ashes of the old. A better world. That was, after all, the goal of Project Elysium. Now let's see if they can get it right this time. And there you have it, today's full story. I hope you guys enjoyed. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell right here on this channel, as it will only ever be receiving full stories from the other channel. And if you want to see the videos as they come out, make sure you go check out the Comic Story and Main channel, where you get five days of videos a week. I'll see you next time.